gives the history of life its very quirky, fortuitous, chancy character. We are literally here only because of the good fortune of dinosaur extinction.
we now recognize that birds are dinosaurs, what I study is the long, deep evolution of birds from Mesozoic dinosaurs. The very concept is unimaginable. Why, if that happened, we wouldn't have a chance. How could we possibly hope to fight them? We couldn't, you're right. You're right, Mrs. Bundy. Hurry up, children, finish your lunch. Are the birds going to eat us, Mommy? Birds have been on this planet since Archaeopteryx, 140 million years ago. Doesn't it seem odd that they'd wait all that time to start a, a war? Who said anything about a war? All I said is... Troodon probably fed on our ancestors, the early mammals. It is the most intelligent, adaptable, and successful hunter on the planet. You gotta check your mirrors, just side of your eye. Side of your eye. Success. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. So good to have all of you here today. Glad you could make it. Happy Friday and happy Groundhog Day. Why in the world would a paleontologist be talking about Groundhog Day today? It is admittedly a pretty silly holiday that we have here in the United States, but it does actually have a thing or two to do with various scientific concepts that we're going to be discussing today. Not least of all, rodents. Wonderful excuse to talk about rodents. The most biodiverse group of mammals currently exists today, at least in terms of speciosity. There's so many different species of mammals. Rodentia is the most speciose group within mammalia. We'll also talk a little bit about seasons, talk a little bit about climate and weather, all that good stuff. So I'm glad you're here. This is going to be a rare mammal stream today. Not about rare mammals, but it's rare that we will have a mammal stream, I guess, because I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. For those of you who are new here, 
Uh, an extra special welcome to you. I'm glad you're here. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. You probably know already that a paleontologist is a fossil scientist. I work on dinosaur fossils. That's my specialty. That's what I do. Dinosaurs are what I publish on, what I study, what I dig up during the summer. This past summer, I was digging up dinosaurs in Wyoming and Utah with a really cool, well, a few different crews of really cool people. A lot of overlap between those crews. Anyway, you can meet those crews and see our work, which was broadcast live on Twitch, on the YouTube page. Really excited to be able to go back out there this next summer to Wyoming and to Utah, and maybe Idaho as well. Working on that also. I'll be digging up some Erichthydromians. But anyway, I hope uh, you stick around if you're new here, and let me know if you've got any questions. This channel is all about trying to bring natural history, the fossil record, science, to all of you. So if you have any questions at all, any questions at all, please do not hesitate to ask them. That's the beauty of a live platform like this, Twitch. You know, you can ask questions and get answers in real time. That's what makes this such a wonderful platform for... Uh, for interactive science outreach. So yeah, yeah. Um, before we get into, well, some of you from overseas are probably wondering what in the world is Groundhog Day? Well, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. I'll get to that soon. But first, let me go through chat and say hello to everybody who's already here. And uh, we've already lost the top of chat, shoot. And also apologies for being late today. I spent over an hour trying to get OBS to work properly. Trying to get all the cameras to work at the same time. And... Oh, boy. Uh, yeah. But, uh, Matt M33, I'm glad you're here. You were here before we even started. It's good to see you. Kodali2010, howdy howdy. Lenina, hope you're having a great day. It's good to see you. Thank you for everything you do, Lenina. Uh, Tony is my baby, is here early today. How you doing, Tony? Welcome. Welcome. And Matt M33, did I? I did say hello to you, didn't I? Of course I did. You were the first today. Well, hello again, Matt. Official Curly TV, howdy howdy to you. I hope you're doing well. Yeah. Uh, the Dinosaur Dave, howdy howdy. It's good to have you here. Um, and who else have we got? Man, this, this is awful quiet right now. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, yeah, Niffler, how are you doing? Howdy. Howdy. I'm not sure about the Discord messages. Sometimes I forget I even have a Discord, honestly. So I don't know a lot about that. I wouldn't worry too much about it. I certainly don't. Trappy Jenkins, how are you doing? Howdy, howdy, Trappy. It's good to see you today. Hope you're having a good day. And Phoenix the Archaeologist says, Bone Squad, Danny, Lenina, and Claire. Oh, hello to you too, Phoenix the Archaeologist. I'm glad you've been listening to GeoGym. That is excellent. GeoGym is super awesome. And, uh... Really glad you've been enjoying what he has to say about geology. All kinds of cool people here on Twitch, you know? Uh, he's one of them. Um, so yeah, Spinonicus Art, how are you doing? Finally, you can attend a stream. Welcome back, Spinonicus Art. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Are my closed captions working, by the way? They're not. Shoot, let's try them now. Closed captions, testing, testing. All right, good. We are working. It is Groundhog Day, and we are streaming live. Excellent. We've also got Grim Deviant, Christy S, Might Shiny, Sweet, and Sauerkraut. What a great name. Golgonek. How are you doing, Golgonek? Howdy, howdy. Um, Salamander is back. So is the Semicolons. How are you doing, Semicolons? How are things? Reagan Nation. Hello, hello to you. That Texas Cryptid. Welcome. Welcome. Risa Degu says, rodent time. Yes. My uh, 50,000 a year has been well spent. What? 27 months. That's almost a February worth of subscription. True that, Dinosaur Dave. Thank you for the 27 months of support. Really appreciate that, Dinosaur Dave. Really appreciate that. We've got an extra long February this month, by the way. Yeah. Thank you for continuing to keep me online for as long as you have, Dinosaur Dave. I appreciate it. I really do, especially at tier three. 
That's pretty extraordinary. That means you get access to uh, to these emotes like you're using earlier. Uh, oh, and uh, and the Sinusoropteryx ones too. It's only for tier two and above. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Will six two. How are you doing? Howdy, howdy. Uh, Spinonicus Art asks, why is there a Groundhog Day? We'll talk about that. I was kidding earlier. It's not because the United States lost a war against groundhogs. Um, that's Australia and emus you may have been thinking of. And you were thinking of. There we go. Yeah. And drawing a Margosaurus. Nice. Nice, Spinonicus Art. Yeah. We've got Samich Nom Nom and Steely Dan. We've got Hugin. We've got Riddler. We've got Pimpcat, and we've got Tren K. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome. As your fire says an Xbox reference from somebody who famously doesn't play games on Twitch. Yeah, as your fire, I had to dig deep for that one. You know, I don't know if I've ever actually played Xbox for more than like two minutes at like a sleepover party at a friend's house when I was like ten years old or something. Yeah, yeah. I've certainly never owned an Xbox. But yeah, anyway. Um, you know, it's Twitch. You gotta make the occasional video game reference. You know? And speaking of which... Here. Let's do that... Right now. Or this one. How's that? <laughs> you know, they say the medium is the message. I don't know, sometimes you have to throw a few things in to make the message fit the medium as well. That's what I'm trying to do here. Tiny Boss Ginger, howdy howdy, good to have you here. Millie Stark, hello hello. Baja Spencer, how are you doing? PSI Bouncer, hello all, who doesn't like less winter? Um, a lot of animals, <laughs> but I'm not here to nitpick. Smartphosaurus, how are you doing? Howdy, howdy. Uh, Roseanne says, I saw the Groundhog Day musical last week. It was pretty good. Nice. I didn't know there was a musical. Um, and Bella Messina says, hey all, excited for another fun stream. Well, you are in the right place, Bella. Welcome back. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Dandy Him So sorry about the double hydrate. No worries. Here, let me uh, let me redeem that, shall we? And Hogan, how are you doing? Howdy, howdy. An official Curly TV says, 400 meters from my house. That's very close. It's a very famous mammal fossil site here in Germany. My hometown is called. Uh, Sandelhaus Sandelshausen. It's not, it's not Messel, is it? Official Curly? If you live near Messel, that's super, super cool. When I hear famous mammal fossil site in Germany, I immediately think Messel. But I'm not a mammal guy. I don't... Fossil mammals are not my specialty. They're not what I work on. So there might be other fossil mammal sites that are quite famous in Germany that I wouldn't be aware of. But, um... Yeah. Anyway, and ahoy to you too. Ahoy hoy, Riddler. Yeah, the emus did a number on us, never forget. I know, right? Emus. Wonderful birds. They're on your official national coat of arms, are they not? Rosand? Uh, Andy Aspian says, have you seen the Dino app on the Apple Vision Pro? I don't know what an Apple Vision Pro is. Is that like a set of glasses that are carved out of apples or something? Very biodegradable? I don't know what that is. So no, I'm not aware. <laughs> Synthberry says, what do you think of panspermia? Sounds messy, Synthberry. Sounds messy. I don't know if I want to be involved in that. Um, no, I don't know. It's, I really... People make so much of a big deal about, you know, the origins of life and... Uh, oh, well, maybe it happened elsewhere. It's like, well, if it happened elsewhere, then the problem just becomes, how does it arise elsewhere? 
I don't know, it seems like a cop-out, the whole idea of panspermia. This is coming from somebody who doesn't really know anything about abiogenesis. I don't work on unicellular life. That's not my realm of expertise, so who cares what I think about it? But the idea of panspermia has always seemed like a cop-out to me. Um, Synthberry says, nice Marshall McLuhan. I don't, I legitimately don't know who or what that is, Synthberry. But if you want to attribute some kind of uh, knowledge to me, go redhead. <laughs> I'll take it. Appreciate you. Yeah. And it's the dinosaur man. Okay. Okay. Tiny toxic tofu. Thank you so much for those two months of support. Appreciate that very much. Thank you, thank you. Tiny Toxic Tofu. It's because of recurring subscribers like you that this whole thing is possible, so thank you for keeping me here on the air with your continued support. That means a lot. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah. Dinosaur Dave says the emus are on there because we lost. Never forget. You know? Yeah. And Salamander says, it's like VR Apple TV with Prehistoric Planet on or something. Sounds cool. Hey, if it's involved with Prehistoric Planet, I'm for it. And I like eating apples. You know? Yeah. A wonderful natural source of, uh, of sugar and, and fiber, too, I think. Yeah. It makes me hungry for apples. Shoot, I should... I should, uh, I should put apples on the grocery list. Yeah. And Synthberry says he was a communications scientist slash philosopher. Oh. I'm not I'm not familiar, Synthberry, but I feel like I should be familiar. Um Yeah. And it's Apple's VR headset. Interesting. Sandalhausen. Oh. Sandalhausen. Very cool. Very cool. Let's translate this page to the Anglish. Uh, neat. <clears throat> That's actually super cool. Um, like, if that's a fossil rhino, this is probably like Oligocene or later. Maybe Miocene? Um, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Not not a huge number of, uh, of images here. But maybe there's something I'm not, I don't know to search for because I'm not well familiar with this. I'm not a mammal guy, you know? Um, but it is... Oh, Miocene. Nice. Um, very cool. The fossil Lagerstadt. Lagerstadt is like a, a fossil site with exquisite preservation. Oftentimes you get complete skeletons. You get, like, because of really fine-grained sediment, often, like, ash-based. Um, you get sometimes preserved fossil tissue integument like skin or feathers or fur sometimes even internal or organs um very cool history of investigation fauna geology and age really really neat yeah and look at all of the cool critters ostracods mollusks teleost fish amphibians reptiles birds marsupials lipo typhla i forget what those are but it's another kind of mammal bats carnivorans and this actually makes a really good point. Rodents. We've got 18 species of rodent in there. This is the most... Uh, the most species group of mammals in this... Assemblage. And that's because at this point, mammals... Or rodents have already evolved. You can't have rodents before rodents evolved, obviously. So, they had evolved at this point, and they are already super diverse. 18 species just from this one site. Rodents are what we're going to be talking about today for uh, 
for Groundhog Day. So this is excellent. Um, thank you, Official Curly. And if anybody wants to take a look at this PDF, here is a link. Check it out. Very nice. Yeah. Um, oh, the medium is the message. Oh, gotcha, Synthberry. Oh, okay, okay. I admit, I only have the most rudimentary understanding of that concept. My reach is exceeding my grasp. To quote somebody else who I don't know who they are. <laughs> anyway, Synthberry, I appreciate you. Um, I need to read more philosophy. I really do. Yeah. Unlike a lot of scientists, I feel like I understand, at least on some level, that philosophy is really important. I need to get more into it. Yeah. Um, and Salamander says, more of an orange gal myself. Sumo oranges? We're not here to compare apples and oranges, sloppy salamander. <laughs> Unless it's on the tree of life. Um, in fact... Let's do that. Here is our tree of life at onezoom.org. Let's go from an apple here to an orange, and we'll compare them. Comparing apples and oranges. Man, it is nested way down deep in there. Angiosperms are such a specious group. And these are probably dicot angiosperms. Also incredibly diverse. Yeah. Um. Amelia Bedelia says, I love the variety of things. Learning here is fun. Good. Good. You know, even though I'm a dinosaur guy, we still try and talk about other topics as well, like... Apples versus oranges. And I hope an Osage orange is actually a type of orange. Otherwise, I'm taking you on a wild botanical journey here. Hmm. Osage orange. Well, close enough. I don't know. Orange. Mexican orange. Okay, this looks like it's actually closer to what an orange is. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, nice. In fact, I thought I saw some orange fruits over here. There we go. Yeah. Nice. Anyway, oranges to apples. Um, but yeah, yeah. How the heck are apples endangered? It's probably their the wild strain is endangered. It's kind of like with cows, where cows the the ancestral species is extinct. Um the auroch or aurochs is extinct. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. So I guess endangered in the wild, the uh, the ancestral apple. Yeah. Anyway, let's go from there to uh, Rodentia, which is the topic of today's stream. Um. And is this a special software? No, here, let me show you. Give me command for this. Herp. There we go. Yeah. Onezoom.org is the one we're looking for. That's this one right here, I mean. Yeah. And Smay wants to know, if you find plant fossils while looking for dinosaurs, do you leave them or extract them? We definitely collect them, yeah. Absolutely. It's not common to find plant fossils alongside dinosaur fossils. Because sometimes they've got different... Uh, they're preserved in different kinds of of preservational environment, or like different preservational um, conditions. 
are better for bones or better for plants. But, uh, but people who find fossil plants... We'll get back to rodents in a minute. People who find fossil plants... They often know exactly where to look for them. And I think... Not it there. I'm trying to find you a decent clip here. There we go. Yeah. Check this out. Actually, let me get this set up properly for viewing. There we go. Yeah. The record for clues. You guys know where we are? Somewhere up in here. Somewhere on the southeast. Yeah. Thanks, Dad. Welcome, welcome. Good to have you here. The badlands of Montana and North Dakota have attracted fossil hunters intent on solving the mystery of dinosaur extinction. Yeah. So that's Kirk Johnson, who is now director of the National Museum of Natural History, the Fossil Museum at the, the Smithsonian. Dinosaurs are sexy, there's no question about that, but they're quite rare, and they're a lot of work. Yeah, if you know how to find them, fossil plants are a lot more common. I don't really fossil know how to find them. Fossil leaves tell you a real different story. They give you the context. I mean, if you look at the world today, it's a green planet, and plants cover the surface of the Earth. Plants are living in environments and responding to them, so you can learn quite a bit from the world from looking at the plants. Not only that, but since plants are common on the landscape, they're common as fossils. And we've done counts in modern forests and found that you get, for instance, in a single forest, there are 10 million leaves produced per acre per year. Yeah. So looking at the fossil plants really gives you a window into the late Cretaceous world that is um, more informative than just looking at the animals. Yeah. So the way that you find fossil plants is usually by cracking open rocks like this. And this is not how we find fossil bones. So it's a different kind of work that's involved with finding fossil plants. Finding fossil leaves like this, especially. Does that make sense? <laughs> Wanna come up here? Yes? No? Sometimes remnants of several plants are preserved on a single rock. The sound. Ooh. Okay. Whoa. Leaves from a water lily and a magnolia like plant may appear side by side. Over the last decade, oh. Johnson has collected there more she than 30,000 plant fossils. Well, well, well. Sweetie pie. Hi. Look, it's right here. There. 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 There you go. She's decided to be camera shy today. That's her prerogative. That is uh, one of my feline overseers here, Ms. Sweetie Pie. Yeah. Um, I would like to do some cat emotes at some point. One for Sweetie Pie, one for Minnie Pie, one for the elusive Moon Pie. Yeah, she's making sure you're doing a good job. Hopefully I am. What do you think, Sweetie Pie? Yeah. She didn't have anything to say, so hopefully that means we're golden. Yeah. Anywho, back to uh, Kirk Johnson here. Specifically. And fossil leaves. Whoa. Leaves from a water lily and a magnolia-like yeah. plant may appear side by side. Very nice. Over the last decade, Johnson has collected more than 30,000 plant fossil specimens. That's a lot. That's a lot. 
And they tell us a tremendous amount about what the environment was when Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops wandered around in western North Dakota. If you look at this leaf, for instance, it's got a smooth margin, an elongate pointed tip, and that's the kind of leaf you find today in tropical rainforests, areas that have a lot that of rainfall. Drip tip there and ample temperatures. They don't get too cold in the winter, and there's always water around. Yeah. It's really different than what it is here today. Now it's a desert or high plains. 66 million years ago, this was probably a broken uh, subtropical forest. <laughs> so fossil leaves are indicators of the climate in which they grew. So from looking at these fossil leaves, we can tell that this area was moist and of you, moderate climate. We find Cheers. fossil palm leaves here palm leaves near the Canadian border. So we're looking at a place where conditions are much warmer and much wetter than they are today. Cool stuff. That's why fossil plants are so, so, so important. Um, that's not what I study, but tremendous respect to the people who do study fossil plants. Like that. Yeah, and it was a treat seeing Moon Pie yesterday. She rarely shows up. She's actually, that's the first time she's ever showed up on my stream. So, pretty excited about that. Yeah. Um. Anywho, but the subject of today's stream, really, is rodents. Because today is Groundhog Day. And, uh, some of you are already familiar with what Groundhog Day is. But just in case you're not... If you happen to be maybe from overseas, not from the U.S., let's do a brief explainer. We'll talk about what Groundhog Day is. Let's see here. Yeah, let's go to... Why groundhogs supposedly predict the weather on Groundhog Day. Here we go. As the tradition goes, every year on February 2nd, Phil the Groundhog comes out of his hole in Puxatawney, Pennsylvania. If he sees his shadow, we'll supposedly get six more weeks of winter. Hmm. If he doesn't see his shadow, Winter is supposedly over. Uh, so, yeah. I don't know why, but in this country, our seasons are dictated by a, a big, fat rodent like that. Um, yeah. One like this, right here. Seems bizarre, right? So, how exactly did groundhogs become the go-to animal for predicting the weather? That's not bad for a quadruped. You gotta check your mirrors. It seems legit, says Tommy Blodigus. <laughs> the tradition Uh, recently it says, It is the day you let rodents decide your weather for enough in the future you forgot what they said. Yeah. You know, it's like horoscopes or whatever. Well, actually, no. This is, this is more reliable than that, I suppose. But, yeah. Do we have any fossilized groundhogs? We do, Yugen. We do. We'll be talking about a bunch of different fossil rodents today as well. Yeah. comes from Germany on an old religious holiday called Candlemas Day. Mm. So this is the thing, is that Groundhog Day actually doesn't just take its origins from Catholic tradition, but from pagan tradition. Pretty much every holiday finds its origins in pagan ritual. And we have a clip of that as well. Here. Oh, what noble visionary thought up April Fool's Day. Like Halloween and Christmas, April Fool's Day traces its origins to pagan ritual. God bless those pagans. April 1st <laughs> used to be the pagan New Year. Blood for Bow! Blood for Bow! Blood for Bow! The Christians changed their calendar and ridiculed those who didn't. Happy New Year! Hi ho, pagans! New Year's was three months ago, but here's a present <laughs> anywho. It's ram's blood for your godless ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> April Fools. <laughs> <laughs> now who's laughing? Now who's laughing? And 
That's the story of April Fool's Day. Dad, I was telling the story. <laughs> so in the same way, Groundhog Day also traces its origins to pagan ritual. As I understand it, I don't know if it was, it wasn't April 1st, well, April 1st might have been New Year's, I don't know if that's correct. But February 2nd is about halfway between the winter solstice and the spring equinox in the Northern Hemisphere. And as such, it was an important day uh, to ancient peoples. And they had like a, you know, holiday to help celebrate that. And then that was later taken over by, uh, I guess, the Catholic Church, Candlemas Day. And, uh, yeah, I think we might have another video about that, too. Where was that? Um, let's see. Well, maybe it was here. I don't know. Let's continue with this one. The Germans paid attention to the badger. Go back. Weather. That's not bad for a quadruped. You gotta yeah. check your ears. Just side of your eye. Side of your eye. The tradition comes from Germany. On an old religious holiday called Candlemas Day, the yeah. Germans paid attention to the badger. The badger? Candlemas Day was the midpoint between winter solstice and the spring equinox. What did I tell you? Yeah, yeah. On February 2nd. If the badger saw its shadow, it meant that a second winter was coming. Hmm. When the practice came to the U.S. in 1887, the groundhog was chosen because badgers aren't native to eastern North America. And is that true? Are there really actually no badgers in eastern North America? I know that American badgers are very different from European badgers in terms of temperament. I think those of you from Europe, you're used to looking at badgers and going like, oh yeah, look at those, look at those cute, chill badgers. Um, but, uh... And if dinosaurs had not died, I imagine that mammals would still be small creatures like this, living in the nooks and crannies of their world, and we wouldn't be here. Um, Alzura, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Yeah, I think this pretty well illustrates it, actually. Um, yeah. So this person, I guess, tweeted this. They said, I can't get over how European badgers look like they're going to invite you over to their country cottage for tea and biscuits. Now, the North American badger looks like he's going to invite you into a back alley for a curb stomping. Our badgers here in North America are much meaner than your European badgers. You know? <laughs> uh, so, trying to, you know... They, they just have a, a less cuddly demeanor overall. You know? Yeah. The wind and the willows effect. There you go, Azure Fire. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, look, look at this right here. <laughs> you couldn't do this with an American badger. Uh, they, you know... They'll bite your face off. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, I guess Groundhog Day, you can trace it back to Candlemas Day, a German holiday where they look at badgers and see, oh, let's all go to the badger's den and see if the badger sees his shadow. The badger's a good indicator of, you know, if he's coming out of his den, that means that it, spring is almost here, that kind of thing. Um, you really can't do that with American badgers. Regardless of whether or not they exist on the East Coast. I think they do, or at least they used to. But anyway. Um, the groundhog yeah. was chosen because badgers aren't native to Eastern North America. While it may seem random, does, yeah. there is some logic to turning to the groundhog for weather predictions. Hmm. Like badgers, groundhogs also known as woodchucks or whistle pigs, are considered true hibernation. Marmots. They're marmots. When they emerge These from are hibernation, it means winter is almost over. 
In winter months, their body temperature drops 62 degrees. Comparatively, if a human body temperature drops just 4 degrees, it goes into hypothermia. A groundhog's hibernating heartbeat is only 5 beats per minute. In warmer months, its heart beats 80 times per minute. Their breathing slows down in winter, too. It can go from 16 breaths per minute to about 2 during hibernation. Badger However, why? the idea that groundhogs are predicting the weather when they come out of hibernation may be a bit of a stretch. Yeah. Six more weeks of winter, it must be! The real reason groundhogs come out of their holes in early February is to look for mates. Mating season is in March. Is that so true? So they wake up a little early to scope out potential partners. I don't know if that's true. And return to their burrow to wait out the winter. Because I think if you have a mated pair of badgers, I think normally they, or not badgers, excuse me, a mated pair of marmots, aka groundhogs. A mated pair of marmots will actually den together in the same den, I think. And I think we'll see that in another video coming up. Whether the groundhog sees its shadow on February 2nd has been to the, the snake. I like that, that a lot. That's a good character. The groundhog itself. Yeah. After all, Puxatani Phil has only been right about 30% of the time. Oh boy. What? Get it right for a change. So we're probably better off listening to meteorologists. Yeah. Or just flipping a coin. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Groundhog Day. It's, uh, it's some interesting stuff, you know? Here. Um, let's go back to the badgers for a minute, and you'll see how far they are from rodents. Badgers are kind of carnivorous, and they're kind of mustelid, actually. Which is a group within carnivora. There's the American badger right there. Taxidea taxus. But honey badgers, Japanese badgers, Asian badgers, Sunda stink badgers, they sound lovely. And then, where's the European badger? That's genus Melis, right? Yeah. And, oh, okay, yeah, they're over there. So that that's good. Like, badgers are actually... Uh, they are a monophyletic group, so it's not like they're, you know, polyphyletic. It's not like we've got, um, it's not like they don't share a recent common ancestor. They actually do. That's cool. That's cool. And skunks are nearby, Baja Spencer. Yeah, sk skunks are right over here. Um, here, let's jump from them to skunks. So skunks, weasels, badgers, stoats are all part of Mustaloidia. Um, well, weasels are right there, but the broader group is Mustaloidia. Where are they? Um, They're not named here as such, but that's what it is. Weasel, stoats, and more. Yeah. Anywho, that must be this group. I think this is Mustaloidia. It's otters, martens, minks, badgers, skunks, stoats, and their kin. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Yeah, and must. Well, I mean, that's, um... They're, they're musty animals. They have, like, stink glands like that. Scent glands. Must glands. Yeah. Isn't a skunk just a stink badger, says Baja Spencer? No, stink badgers are actually a group unto their own. Yeah. Stink badgers. Right here. There's two species extant in genus Mydaus. The Palawan stink badger. And the Sunda stink badger. Very cool. From Indonesia, I think. Yeah. Good stuff. And happy Friday to you. Happy Groundhog Day, Dormir Bell. Let's go to groundhogs. They are way far away from these guys. They're not part of Mustaloidia. 
They are far away in Rodentia. Let's go to the rodents right here. Yeah. There we go. The rodents. This is the most speciose like rank of mammals at, at this size, I guess. Rodents, there are more species of rodent than of any other like kind of equivalent size group of mammals. Or equivalent rank or I don't know. Ranks are arbitrary anyway. My point is there's a ton of rodents. There's so many rodents, over 2000 species. And within that, we've got marmots. And groundhogs are a kind of marmot. I think a yellow-bellied marmot is a groundhog. Yeah, marmots. There's 14 species of them. And the yellow-bellied marmot, which to me, that phrase always sounded like something that a grizzled prospector would yell at a, at a claim jumper as an insult, you know? You yellow-bellied marmots! <laughs> oh. It just, it feels like a quaint frontier insult, you know? <laughs> but yeah, the yellow-bellied marmot right there. Um, I'm pretty sure this is the groundhog, like, like Punxsutawney Phil. But you know what, let's... Let's check that. Let's check that. Uh, behavior, diet... Um... Maybe they're not yellow-bellied marmots. Maybe they're a different kind. Let's go to Wikipedia. Groundhog Day. Yeah. Uh, observed in the United States and Canada on February 2nd of every year. Uh, it derives from a Pennsylvania Dutch superstition that if a groundhog emerges from its burrow on this day and sees its shadow, it will retreat to its den and winter will go on for six more weeks. If it does not see its shadow... Spring will arrive early in 2024. An early spring was predicted. Oh, spoilers. We're going to look at that. But a groundhog is... Oh, Marmota Monax. Okay, okay. Um, Marmota Monax. That is... Woodchuck, yeah. Marmota Monax. So it, it's... It's a kind of marmot. You know? It's within genus Marmota. Right there. Yeah, marmot. Large ground squirrels. So, this really is a day that kind of celebrates... Squirrels. How many people in chat maybe hadn't realized that that groundhogs are a kind of squirrel. Kind of ground squirrel. They're part of Skewria Day, which is the, the squirrel uh, squirrel family. Yeah. And they updated the wiki really fast? That was probably... Yeah, that, you'd be surprised, Dormio Bell. Some of these are extremely fast. Yeah. And Purgatorius is a fun, not a rodent. Mommy does, yeah. Yeah. It's thought to be a primate ancestor, Purgatorius. Yeah. And you never knew that? Yeah. Groundhogs, aka woodchucks, are kind of squirrel. Here, let's... Let's talk about this group of animals real quick before we look at footage of today's... Of today's ceremony. Today's... Dumptuous pagan ritual. <laughs> Groundhog day. Here, check this out. Here's a folksy kind of video here from the Science Museum of Virginia. This is going to be fun. This here is a groundhog. Groundhog! They're also known as woodchucks, <laughs> land beavers, and whistle pigs. Now these marmots clock in at about 16 to 26 inches long and weigh only about 5 to 10 pounds. Ain't it amazing that this little critter can dig out about 700 pounds of dirt while making its burrow? <laughs> That's about the same weight as an old grizzly bar. But dig they must, and boy, <laughs> they do. Almost all over North America. 
common groundhog has been spotted as far south as Alabama and as far north as Alaska. Alaska! Yep. But it's not all <laughs> peace and quiet for the groundhog. Its predators include snakes, foxes, wolves, and humans. Except Bill Murray, of course. Bill Murray! So when you're flipping through all this Groundhog Day hubbub, remember there's more to this little critter than the story about his shadow. Yep, there you go. They're pretty cool critters, Marmots. They, they honestly are. And uh, now that you've got that, why don't we take a look at the video from this morning in Pennsylvania. Breaker, please place the royal red carpet. Mr. Vice President, please place the scrolls upon This the is... I... This is kind of a bizarre American tradition. And I'm really pleased to be able to offer it to... Some of you are not from these United States, or from Canada, where we have Groundhog Day, both countries. So this might seem utterly bizarre. And you know what? It is. It is. It's so weird, but it's also fun. And so I'm so pleased to present this to you. You know? Uh, Gentlemen, are you ready? And there go Mommy does. We can talk about Purgatorius, yeah. Yeah. Are you ready? This is a dumb tradition. I mean... Yeah. It's a tradition. Before we get Phil out, we get him fired up by chanting Phil, 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 Phil. Look at all those people. Nope, oh, audio issues. They're having audio issues there. Live broadcast, you know? It's not just. Those of us broadcasting on Twitch got to deal with audio malfunctions. Uh, and Rusty Guy. Yeah, there are different pretenders to the throne. Other marmots across the U.S. who also have, you know, uh, cults of followers like this, and they make prognostications about the weather. Punxsutawney Phil is the most famous of these, however. It's Punxsutawney Phil! <laughs> Behold, rodent! Bow before it, commoners! <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah. Gentlemen, gather round! <laughs> Turn the fan on. We have a decision. Somebody didn't follow the dress code here. This is a black tie event. A prediction has been made, Mr. President. <laughs> Getting his honor right there. You go, Trent K. Hear ye, hear ye. Now on this February This is a new guy this year, I think. Phil, the seer of seers prognosticator of all prognosticators, was awakened from his wintry nap at dawn on Gobbler's Knob. Phil looked to the skies and then, speaking in groundhog ease, directed the president to the proper scroll, which reads, Another winter's slumbered pause so I could meet the crowd. Hard to sleep anyway when the party's this loud. I envy your energy. I envy the fun. I envy all of you and your opposable thumbs. Hmm. But it's not what I feel, it's what I see and what you hear. So gather round and let me be clear. Atmosphere is a wonderful thing. And we can create our own and the weather it brings. It brings hope for the future and so much more. Maybe some Punxsutawney Phil write-in votes in 2024. We'll see. But what this weather did not 
provide is a shadow or reason to hide. Glad tidings on this Groundhog Day. An early spring is on the way. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, this might seem quaint, but, you know, we need to be respectful of people in their religious traditions like this, you know? Uh. <laughs> uh. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Tell the world. The news is here. Yep. There you go. However, Somewhere along the way, there have been, like in all religions, there have been schisms. You get competing doctrines. You get prophets espousing different ideas, different ideologies. And here, we have an additional... Well, we have another groundhog from the American South, from Georgia. Georgia's famous groundhog, General Beauregard Lee, oh boy, did not see his shadow Friday, which means an early spring in store this year. Here he comes. Wow, he's huge. Look at how big he is compared to that house. Visitors from as far as Virginia gathered in the Georgia Nature Preserve to witness the forecast. Dowsett Trails director Ike English says the celebrity groundhog is feeding on corn, sausage, and Waffle House hash browns this holiday. Well, well, well. Uh, Peter Steve says, Danny, I have a question. What if two groundhogs have different results? You know, you might end up with a religious war in that case. Um, certainly religious wars have been fought over less. Uh, there you go, Cryptic Caramel, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the bloodshed could be... Tremendous. But let's take a look at this. History of Groundhog Day from WatchMojo.com. We watched another video from Business Insider about this. That was good. I forgot to put this one on my list, but... I watched this this morning, and it's pretty decent. To predict the weather. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we'll be learning more about Groundhog Day. Hmm. With a liberal uh, sprinkling of... Groundhog of Day is celebrated po annually popular on media clips February and stuff. 2nd. On this day, people yeah. use a groundhog to determine the length of the current winter season and the possible early onset of spring. This weather prediction is dependent on the day's conditions. Six more weeks of winter are on the way if sunshine causes the groundhog to see its shadow and go back into hibernation. Sorry, folks. Six more weeks of winter. While clouds and gray skies prevent the appearance of the groundhog's shadow and result in spring's speedy arrival. <laughs> The period between the winter solstice and spring equinox has been important throughout history. For instance, the Celts anticipated spring by celebrating the pagan festival of Imolk. Some people believe huh. Imolk then evolved into the Christian holiday of Candlemas, which celebrates the presentation of Jesus at the temple and falls on the 2nd of February. Huh. It was during the Middle Ages that Europeans began to rely on the shadows of hibernating animals as an indication of incoming weather. During yeah, the 17 probably and just a tradition. I don't think they actually German like looked at shadows. brought this belief to the United States and selected the groundhog as the chosen animal in Pennsylvania. 
The huh. first official celebration of Groundhog Day occurred in that state's city of Punxsutawney in the late 1880s, when several businessmen and groundhog hunters of the Punxsutawney Groundhog Club watched the groundhog observing his shadow. Though this holiday has since spread across North America, the biggest annual Groundhog Day celebrations remain in its place of origin, where a groundhog dubbed Punxsutawney Phil predicts the weather. Tens of thousands of people and countless media outlets visit the city during early and February is that a to participate in festivities that include music and food. For the actual ceremony, Phil is relocated to Gobbler's Knob by his handlers, made up of a group of top hat and tuxedo wearing individuals called the Inner Circle. <laughs> Though the Punxsutawney Groundhog Club maintains that Phil is right up to 90% uh... of the time, studies have shown the number is actually closer to less than 40%. Mm. This has done nothing to quell people's interest and fascination with the groundhog's forecasts. People just fact, want something to rally behind. Was given you know? even bigger People want to belong. Following the successful they want something to believe in. Comedy, groundhog Day. This is one time where television really fails to capture the true excitement of a large squirrel predicting the weather. Set in Punxsutawney, the <laughs> film also led to Groundhog Day being used... And he is correct. Bill Murray was absolutely right there. It is a large squirrel. It's part of Skewria Day. It's part of the squirrel family. Marmots. Groundhogs are marmots. Marmots are a kind of ground squirrel. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The weather. Set in Punxsutawney, the film also led to Groundhog Day being used as an expression for experiencing situations over and over again. Do you ever have deja vu, Mrs. Lancaster? I don't think so, but I could check with the kitchen. From movies and TV shows to children's toys, Phil and Groundhog Day have appeared in pop culture on numerous occasions. Though Groundhog Day is mostly observed in North America, other countries practice similar traditions. Some American states use other animals instead of the groundhog. Meanwhile, the Canadian city of Wyarton in Ontario is home to a popular festival based around a groundhog named Wyarton Willie. For huh. more great videos, be sure to subscribe to watch more. Interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. And shoot, I should be giving you the links to these videos. Here's one right there. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I have to go watch the movie again for science, of course. There you go, Flug. There you go. Yeah. Now, before we get into, like, a science video... Here. <laughs> Um, yeah, here, let's take a look at this. You know, I, I mentioned earlier about being on Twitch and having to, you know, make the occasional video game reference, even if those are largely lost on me. I don't know what game this is from, but some of you in chat will. And I can at least appreciate that it's funny. The Patriots? The truth behind this country. I'm not surprised you've never heard of them. <laughs> Very few are aware of their existence, even among those with code word clearance. Woodstock, Illinois. Interesting. Surf combat? Cool. Phil has been predicting weather for over 120 years. He is accurate 100 percent of the time. Welcome, Surf Combat. Only the it's president of the Inner Circle talks with Phil. Favorite drink? Need you ask? The Elixir of Life. It grants Phil seven years of life. Prior to the event today, I talked to Phil. Phil had us prepare two scrolls. Wait, how did he talk to Phil? That's a beaver. With this cane, <laughs> it's I can a communicate with Phil. But beavers are also rodents, as we'll be talking about. Politics, <clears throat> the military, the economy. They control it all. They even choose who becomes president. <laughs> Putting it simply, the Patriots rule this country. Shingle Shaker, do you have those scrolls? Yeah. Can you place those scrolls on the stump? And I would ask if we have his royal carpet. Jeff Lundy, the brains behind the organization. If I wasn't working on Groundhog's Day activities, I'd probably be tracking down and converting those who doubt the all-knowing weather power of the Seer of Seers. Who's the Seer of Seers? Ladies and gentlemen, the Seer of Seers, the great awesome weather forecaster, folks, and Phil. Oh, Phil. Bud Dunkel, 
Little is known about him. He is the true puppeteer behind the organization. And his right-hand man, Butch Filibur, also known as the Iceman. His philosophy? The application of science and technology to predict the state of the atmosphere is about as believable as the government telling you they are here to help. When you hear... And you have, I know, right, Lordy? Yeah. Be a you know, it, he has the ability and the attributes to take a complex meteorological. Sometimes religious costumes are very interesting, entertaining, and descriptive. This country is shaped and controlled <laughs> as the patriots see fit. The people are shown what they want to believe. What you call government is actually a well-staged <laughs> production aimed Excuse at satisfying me. the public. Goodness, huh? and you've got keen ears there, uh, Christias. Wait a minute, let me. Are you there? This one? Is it this one? Okay. Okay. Oh, you, you look beautiful today. All right. <laughs> I've never played any of those hear games, ye, ye, nor am I really familiar with them. But it's a yeah. beautiful morning. This I can see with all my fans viewing virtually. Six more weeks of winter there will be. 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 The Patriots. <laughs> Even I don't know who the actual members are. Anyway, yeah. Um. There's a link to that video right there. Um, Claire, did you beat me to it? There shouldn't have been a timestamp. Oh, whatever. Um. <clears throat> anyway, waiting for a Ko Kojima Groundhog game now. You know. Maybe someday, Dan Karen. We can, one can dream, right? Yeah. And B says, I feel a weird sense of American pride from the Groundhog Soothsayer ceremony. Well, like a chatter was saying earlier. I agree with this. If anybody tries to tell you that... That there's no such thing as American culture... Show them Groundhog Day. You know? But even, I don't know. I Anybody who says that, I always... I don't know. American culture has got such a tremendous draw around the world. You know, ask any, like... You know, ask any immigrant to the United States. They'll tell you the same thing. Holy cow. Just the cultural hegemony that the United States enjoys. It's astonishing. Um, anyway. About craft singles? Lordy. Don't say that. Goodness. Uh, what about In-N-Out Burger? Or, you know, hot dogs. What about pizza? And don't go saying that, like, oh, pizza's actually Italian. You know, margarita pizza in Italy... Very, very different from an American pizza, you know? Yeah. Everything is a remix of something else, ultimately. But many of the things that have been remixed here within the borders of the United States have been, you know, they've spread out across the world afterward. And it's because we've got people who come from all around the world to this country, all sharing their bits of, of culture from their home countries. And, you know, I'm not going to do this big spiel about, you know, how America is the world's greatest melting pot and everything else. It might be. But we can at least admit that we've got some good stuff going here. Sometimes it's a little goofy, like Groundhog Day. And you know what? That's really cool. That's really cool. So yeah, yeah. Now, we've seen some groundhogs, you know, marmots in some unusual circumstances in those clips there. Would you like to see some marmots in their natural habitat, chat? Because I'd like to show you some. Take a look at some marmots. I think these will be yellow-bellied marmots here. Which will not be Marmota Mon Monax, like the woodchuck. But I think these will be these guys, yellow-bellied marmots. 
like I used to see in Montana all the time. Especially up on mountainsides and stuff. Uh, let's take a look right here at Marmot Hibernation. Marmots are twice as fat now as in the spring. Unlike stags, who've just lost one-fifth of their body mass. Hmm. For half a year, these alpine rodents have stuffed themselves. That doesn't look like eating, though. That looks like gathering something for... Now it's time to make yeah. the den cozy Watch. for a long winter underground. And do some home decorating. To hold out six months underground, you want a comfy home. <laughs> In this den, the male prepares the bedding. His mate supplies the hay. Out there, it's risky. But as long as the chuffs are watching, one can relax. So they kind of rely on birds as their, uh, their lookouts. A safe, well-furnished den is a marmot's dream. But it's not Certainly quite there, there yet. There are many more dinosaurs Mo waiting to be discovered. Many new mysteries waiting to be pondered. Claraxi, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. I know we're ta not talking about dinosaurs right now, but, you know, as much as I might hesitate to admit it as a dinosaur paleontologist, I work on dinosaurs. There's more to paleontology than just dinosaurs. Paleontology is the history of life on Earth as told through the fossil record. And the history of rodents is something that we're going to be talking about today in celebration of Groundhog Day. So check it out. But it's not quite there yet. More padding is wanted. Hmm. Oh. Even when the bed's perfect, with a restless bedfellow, a good rest is hard to get. Oh, those teeth. Those big incisors. Marmots cozy up as families to keep warm. The hmm. temperature inside the den decreases gradually from 60 degrees in autumn to freezing in spring. Oh, look at the shiver. The animals also lower their body temperature down to about 40 degrees plus. They survive on their body's storage of fat and water. With thick layers of snow and soil on top, the entrance to their extensive den securely blocked, the marmot is nature's paragon of bunker mentality. <laughs> There's not the slightest draft down here no matter how hard the storm may blow outside. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool indeed. Um, looks like, Claire, you already found a link to this video right here. Thank you. Wait, was that the same one? It was. Nice, Claire. Nice. Yeah. So those are marmots. Those are within the same genus. They're a sister species to the woodchuck, a.k.a. groundhog, like we've been talking about. But they're also marmots. And that kind of deals with their hibernation like we were talking about. That's one of the whole points behind Groundhog Day, I suppose. But things aren't always super cozy for marmots. Sometimes they have predators to watch out for. Like you'll see in this clip. Eight out of ten eagle kills are marmots. Uh oh. Most of them youngsters. Yeah, dinosaurs exactly, clever eagles. Even these heavyweights once had a risky childhood. This has got to be in Europe somewhere. So these are not yellow-bellied marmots, these are probably... Who would these be? These would be... Not yellow-bellied marmots, but perhaps... 
Olympic marmots? Holy marmots? I'm not sure. These all seem like they're North American. Um, Altai marmot, Himalayan marmot. I'm guessing these are somewhere up in Europe, because that looked like an ibex or something right here. When rough play gets too rough, mother has to interfere. The eagle is always on her mind. Marmata, marmata, alpine. Thank you, Cliff Alistair McLean. Thank you. The old eagle's trick. Pretending to leave, letting the target relax. Uh oh. Some clever predatory dinosaurs. Soaring overhead. Then a surprise return under the radar. Oh. Oh ho 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 ho. Oh ho ho. Watch out, marmots. Decelerating from 150 miles an hour. Holy cow. Not even a cheater. And look at that. You know? <laughs> you know what this reminds me of? Like, lock S foils in attack position. <laughs> uh, you know, fire some uh, proton torpedoes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you've turned off your targeting computer. What's wrong? Decelerating from 150 miles an hour. Not even a cheetah would outrun an eagle. Oh no, of course not. Woof. That was close. That was so close. <laughs> Stop roasting. <Rose's> <laughs> It's the bullseye marmots back in my T-16 back home. <laughs> They're not much bigger they must than two have meters. Heard the mother panting. And also that deadly swoosh of wings. Oh, man. How good to be alive. <laughs> good boss, Spencer. How good to be alive in indeed. Um, what a, what a lovely video there. Claire already posted the link, but let me do it again. There we go. Yeah. Anyway. Good stuff. Marmots. Rodents in general are tremendously successful animals. Be they North American marmots like our fabled groundhog, or European marmots like that one. The thing is, rodents did not exist during the age of dinosaurs. They're actually fairly new in the grand scheme of things. Rodents first evolve around like the Eocene period, I think, or Eocene epoch. Um, yeah, here, let's take a look on Wikipedia. Classification, evolution, evolutionary history. Uh, dentition is the key feature by which fossil rodents are recognized. That's true for almost all mammals. And the earliest record of such mammals comes from... Oh, the Paleocene. Never mind. Shortly after the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs, some 66 million years ago. Yeah. Some molecular clock data suggest modern rodents, members of Order Rodentia, had appeared by the late Cretaceous, although other molecular divergence estimations are in agreement with the fossil record. So this is one from Messel in Germany from the Eocene. I was talking about Messel earlier, famous fossil site in Germany. That is a beautiful specimen. Look how it's even got that, like, soft tissue, like, carbon film preserved right there. You can kind of see the outline of its body. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. 
Yeah. And Mary L wants to know, can I explain why rodents, or why, why rabbits are not rodents? Yes. Rabbits are close to rodents, but not quite rodents. They're just outside. Here, let me show you back to our tree of life. Let's go up to rodents from our marmots here. So many rodents. So there's rodents right there. About 2,096 species of them. Um, and so there was one ancestral rodent that gave rise to all these species. So that would have lived, according to this, 67.4 million years ago. So again, we were reading here, molecular clock, clock data suggests modern rodents, members of the order Rodentia, had appeared by the late Cretaceous. Although other molecular divergence estimations are in agreement with the fossil record. We don't yet have fossils of rodents from before the extinction event. But in on this tree, they must be going from molecular data only. And there's an error bar for molecular data. But they're saying it was before the asteroid impact that rodents diverged here. The one ancestor of all the rodents lived. But, back here, rodents and rabbits. Glyries is the name of this clade. We know that they diverged back in the Cretaceous. So during the Cretaceous period, there was a creature that lived alongside the dinosaurs that was the ancestor of the rodents and the rabbits. So to get to rabbits, Lagomorpha, you go up here. Hares, pikas, and rabbits in Lagomorpha. So this is the sister group to rodents. Rodents and rabbits and the relatives, they share a common ancestor. About 72 million years ago, something like that. I don't know exactly what that critter would have looked like. But it may have been something... It's easy to imagine it, at least, being something kind of like... Uh, kind of like Zalamdelestes here. Something kind of like this. They're being chased by some kind of dromaeosaur, maybe Velociraptor right here. Snout is kind of boxy for Velociraptor, but... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So does that make sense? Rabbits are very close to rodents, but not quite. Not quite. They're just outside of the rodent family tree. Does that make sense? Yeah. And not the rabbit from the Holy Grail. No, definitely not, Musa. Musa. <laughs> uh... And over time, there have been many, many different kinds of rodents. And one of the coolest ones is right here. This, I believe is a rodent. I don't think it's a lagomorph. This is Ceratogallus right here. There is its skull. And it has got these crazy horns on its nose. Very cool stuff right here. Let's take a look at this critter and talk about what makes it so special and why those horns first evolved. Take a look. Just a few million years ago, on what are now the Great Plains of North America, there these are pretty were some very weird rodents. At their largest, these animals were only about the size of a small marmot, so it wasn't their size that made them so strange. It was what they were sporting on their heads. These odd yeah. rodents belong to a genus known as Ceratogallus. But they're more commonly called horned gophers because, you guessed it, they had horns. Specifically, yep. they had a pair of horns that sat side by side on their nasal bones, and these horns... Ugh, I know, I know you're not trying to aggravate me, chat, when you say stuff like this, but like... Yeah, people say, oh, it looks like a Pokemon, it looks like a Pokemon. Is that a Pokemon? No, this is way cooler because it's real. These animals actually lived, and we actually have fossils of them, you know? You can actually dig these up and study them. You don't have to make them up. They really existed. 
and that's incredibly cool, you know? This could get pretty big relative to their body size. And yeah. they're the only rodents we know of to ever have had horns, which is pretty incredible, considering that almost 40% of mammal species alive today are rodents. So what would these ancient rodents- And yeah, by the way, rodents, like I was saying, extraordinarily speciose. What did she say? Almost 40% of mammal species alive today are rodents? Percent of mammal species alive today are rodents. So yeah. what would these ancient rodents have what? needed horns for? Paleontologists have been puzzling over that question ever since the first horned gopher was- The other 60% are bats. No, bats are about 20% of, uh, of mammal species, Charlie's dragons. But yeah, bats are also incredibly specios. Order Chiroptera. Chiroptera mammals. Bats. So many species. So many species. And there's something about being small critters that makes speciation easier, it seems. You can have larger populations. Um, you can have more, uh, like, increased specialization in different environments. It's easier to become different species when you're a small critter. It's much more difficult for animals like elephants to, uh, to develop new species, to have cladogenetic splitting events like that. Because these are big animals and it's hard to keep them separated. It's hard to restrict that gene flow between populations. If you're an elephant, like, you might walk over a big series of hills, you might cross rivers, cross deserts in order to find a mate. If you're a little rodent, you're not going to do that. So it's much easier to fragment populations of rodents and, uh, and get them to, like, basically split off and eventually form new species. It's harder to do that for elephants or for other big animals like that. Speciation seems to be easier with smaller creatures. And uh, part of that also is just that you need less territory, you need less food. All of these things are a factor. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And apparently Ceratogallus is more closely related to the mountain beaver than gophers. Interesting, Nell. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and bats to reproduction too. Absolutely, Psychonalis. You've got shorter generational times. So you actually evolve faster as a rodent than as an elephant. Because it doesn't take you as long to mature. And you can have babies much sooner. An elephant would be pregnant for what, like 18 months or something like that? And they take years and years and years to mature to the point when they can start having babies. But rats, as a sort of an extreme example, they're mature very quickly, and they can start having babies very early on. So you've got really short generational times. So, like, just one pair of rats can become 15,000 rats in, like, just a few years. That does not happen with elephants. You can have 15,000 rats in the time that you just get one new elephant. So, yeah. Yeah. Um... And there you go, Charlie's Dragon, yes. Needing less area means there's more room for species in an area with different niches. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Good stuff. Um, so let's learn about this wonderful horned rodent here. When I was learning about these as a kid, I called them Epigallus. I don't know if that's a different taxon than Ceratogallus, or if it's just been renamed. But, uh, yeah, let's, let's learn about them. Which is pretty incredible, considering that almost 40% of mammal species alive today are rodents. So what would these ancient rodents have needed There you go, Alex Fixon, yeah. Paleontologists yeah. have been puzzling over that question ever since the first horned gopher was described in 1902. That paper even described its anatomy as being a... Ooh, and... It was a Berkeley man who, uh, who wrote this. William Diller Matthew here. Um, I didn't know he described Ceratogallus. This actually shows that, that this must be differ, different from Epigallus, I guess. Um, if it was named this early on by W.D. Matthew. Holy cow. William Diller Matthew. Um, was, uh... 
and one of the founding paleontologists at the University of California Museum of Paleontology, just down the road from me in Berkeley, California, where I got my start as a paleontologist. Um, and yeah, Edwin Colbert, good old Ned Colbert, who worked on Coelophysis, worked on Lystrosaurus in Antarctica. Edwin Colbert married William Diller Matthews' daughter, who is Margaret Matthew. She became Margaret Colbert. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Does anybody remember this? Yeah. Uh, Margaret Colbert, nay, Margaret Matthew. She uh, she drew the, the logo for SVP. Um, yeah, she drew the original SVP logo with the vertebrae and the uh, the rock pick there. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, William Diller Matthew. There's a there's literally a bust of him in the lobby at UCMP, like in the front office at the Museum of Paleontology. I'm always a little bit creeped out when there's like a bust of an old dead white man, but you know, but respect to William Diller Matthew. Yeah. Uh, so apparently he named this critter, Ceratogallus, a long time ago. Shoot, probably like around the turn of the century. Yeah, that man had pers has pers perfected his hairstyle. Yeah, bees. I mean, yeah, this was probably in like the twenties when this kind of hairstyle was uh, was popular. But you know what? It works for him. So good for him. Yeah. Uh, anywho, let's continue. Since the first horned gopher was described in 1902. That paper even described its anatomy as being absurdly like that of a miniature rhinoceros, which, yeah, it kinda is. <laughs> Hypotheses about the function of these horns have included digging, competing for mates, recognizing other members of their species, and defense against predators. And it would take just over a hundred years and a grad student bringing all of the oh, man, together dinosaur together Dave, to yeah. settle the debate. It turns out the horns probably the did yep. have a purpose, yep. one that rodents would likely benefit from today. But unfortunately for modern rodents, it looks like that group only got one evolutionary shot at horns. Uh. At least that we know of. The horned gophers are part of a family of squirrel-like rodents called mylagolids that have no living members. Their closest relatives that are still around today are these kind of ugly cute rodents known as suolils, also called mountain beavers, even though they aren't actually beavers. But ah, somebody in chat mentioned our mountain beavers. I thought maybe that was just the proper name for the American beaver. But no, suolil. Let's take a look at them. Suelel. Mountain beaver. There we go. Aplodontia rufa. Neither a mountain nor a beaver. There you go, Dr. Irrefutable. There you go. That's a misleading name. Yeah. <laughs> Uh Yeah. Hmm. Mountain beaver of the Pacific Northwest. There's one right there. These guys are apparently very elusive. And it's really difficult to actually get video footage of them. But here we have that. Let's skip ahead to where we can actually see it. Yeah, nice. They've got a bunch of stuff there, don't they? <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. And Rat Finkel. Finkel or Finky? Is that an I or an L? I'm going to say Rat Finky. How are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Um, we are indeed talking about rodents today. Happy Groundhog Day to you. Yeah. 
Good stuff, good stuff. And look how close it's getting. Wow. Normally they are very shy from what I've heard. Because I... That name, Suolel, is new to me, but Mountain Beavers, I've heard, are very, very shy. And this looks like a man-made water thing, like almost at a theme park or something like that. There's motion in the water. Furry object begins, begins swimming in our direction. No tail. It's trying to get up there on the banks. There we go. Couldn't tell if it was a mountain beaver or a tailless muskrat. Rodents both. It looked at us as if we were BFFs and then kept moving closer. Very cool. Some blue Danube waltz they put in the background here. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Pretty cool. Well, that is a Suolel, or mountain beaver, which apparently is the closest living relative to our horned rodents, like Ceratogallus that lived during the Pliocene, I want to say. I'm not totally sure about that. It could be Miocene. Yeah. They're also known as boomers. Really? No. I didn't know that. Huh. But the Mylogolids first appear in the fossil record in Western North America during the Oligocene Epoch around 30 million okay. years ago, and diversified into many different species of fossorial or burrowing rodents. The huh. first two species of horned gophers show up around 16 million years ago in the Middle Miocene Epoch. They were the smallest of the horned gophers and had small nasal horns. Then around 12.5 yeah. million years ago, one of these little guys disappears from the fossil record and four new larger species of horned gophers appear. So it could be that one species diversified into four. Interesting. And B says, you ever see a quokka? I love those little guys. They're adorable. Not rodents. They're not even placental mammals. They're marsupials. So that's all that's preventing me from pulling up a video about them right now, because they're very, very charismatic. Like, absurdly charismatic little mammals. But they are marsupials. They're not even placental mammals. Yeah. Yeah. Three of them with taller horns. The largest of these was Ceratogallus hatcheri. It had nasal horns that uh, were 33 mill... And hatcheri, that's got to be named after... John Bell Hatcher, I presume. Yeah, famed dinosaur hunter, John Bell Hatcher. Yeah. Uh, there's a book about him that I haven't read yet. The Museum of Paleontology in Berkeley actually got a review copy of this. And, uh... <laughs> Chris, who runs the front desk, just gave it to me. She's like, yeah, we didn't really have any dinosaur people here. Do you want this, Danny? Yeah. I'd love it. Thank you. Um. Yeah. Yeah. John Bell Hatcher. There he is with a Triceratops right there. In fact, I think I have a... I think this is one of the photos that I have... You know, in my, uh... In my collection here for the frames, you know, for, uh... For stream background. But yeah, yeah. Anywho. Ceratogallus hatcheri, presumably named after John Bell Hatcher. Yeah. 
Cool stuff. Species of horned gophers appear, three of them with taller horns. The largest of these was Ceratogallus hatcheri. It had yeah. nasal horns that were 33 millimeters tall, over one third the total length of its skull. And it stuck around until about five million years ago before becoming hmm. extinct, possibly due to the rise and spread of new groups of carnivores throughout North America at the end of the Miocene. The point huh. is, it's clear from the fossil record that the horned gophers got bigger and their horns got taller over time. Interesting. And this would be an important clue for paleontologists trying to figure out how they developed the horns in the first place and what they used them for. So what drove this odd evolutionary innovation? Well, one of the first ideas about the function of those nose horns was that they were used for digging. We know hmm. that the Mylagolid ancestors of the horned gophers were burrowers. These extinct rodents used their noses to excavate dens and tunnels to avoid predators. This style of bur B says that thing looks like the 90s version of 90s punk version of a gopher and I'm all for it. Oh yeah. <laughs> Burrowing is called head hey, confused kid now. Howdy, howdy. The snout yeah. and the head are essentially used as a shovel, with the neck muscles doing most of the work to lift the dirt out of the way. And hmm. there's physical evidence of this adaptation in the skeletons of these animals. For example, the back of the skulls and the neck vertebrae of head lift diggers have enlarged hmm. areas for powerful muscles to attach. And the nasal bones at the tip of the snout. And so this is this is really important. If we if you're looking at an animal like this. Um, you're looking at a critter like this and you're trying to figure out why in the world did this animal develop horns on its snout like this? What are those for? You can come up with different explanations. Like, oh, maybe it was used for digging. Maybe that's why they developed horns. Maybe it has to do with shoveling dirt out of the way. It's fine to propose ideas like that, but in science, you gotta test those ideas as best you can. In order for an idea to actually be a good one in science, it has to be testable. There has to be a way that you could try and either prove or disprove it. And so in this case, you can find animals that do dig with their snouts, look at what their skulls look like, see if, those, if there's like a pattern there that will also show up in these guys. Does that make sense? I kind of get the impression that a lot of people in the general public think that we as paleontologists just make random guesses about things. Like, oh yeah, this looks right, this sounds right. Yeah, that's not how it works. We have to come up with ways of actually testing our ideas. That's, that's you know, that's, that's science. If you're not testing your ideas, it's not science, you know? So, so yeah. Oh, and this is a lovely illustration right there. Oh, I like that a lot. That's super cute. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Ceratogallus, ladies and gentlemen. And hey, Rachodactylus, howdy howdy. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Um, let's continue. And there's physical evidence of this adaptation in the skeletons of these animals. For example, the back of the skulls and the neck vertebrae of head lift diggers have enlarged areas for powerful muscles to attach. Hmm. And the nasal bones at the tip of the snout tend to be thicker to support an abrasion resistant roughened nose pad. And when huh. you've got thicker nasal bones and muscles that can support a heavier head, you're and already Loki 16, part of the howdy, way howdy. You doing? But none of the modern animals that are head lift diggers have horns, which means yeah. horns probably didn't help with digging at all. In fact, once the first horned gopher evolved its horns, it actually would have been worse at digging than its hornless ancestors. The position huh. of the horn and its shape make it inefficient when you're trying to tunnel forward. And over time, the horns only got taller and moved away from the tip of the snout, making them basically impossible to dig with. It turns out becoming a better digger was not what drove the evolution of the horned gopher's horns, but huh. having digging ancestors gave it the adaptations it would need to eventually support its horns. Okay, so what about competing for mates? While there hmm. aren't any modern... Yeah, for this, in order for it to be competition for mates... Um, it would kind of need to be sexually dimorphic. You would need to have 
strong differences between the males and the females in order for it to be something that sexual selection is actually acting upon. You don't get sexual selection unless you have dimorphism like that. So if both the males and the females have got equally sized horns like this, then we can kind of throw that hypothesis out the window. You know? Aren't yeah. any modern animals with horns that dig by lifting dirt with their heads? There are definitely mammals alive today that use their horns to show off to or fight for potential mates. One horned gopher species is even named for one of these beasts. Its scientific name is Ceratogallus rhinoceros. But in a lot of those <laughs> horned modern species, like Impala and Kudu, the males have horns and the females don't. And it looks yep. like both male and female horned gophers had horns. Ah, so if you don't have strong dimorphism there, it's probably not being sexually selected. There's something else going on. Maybe it's an anti-predator thing? Or, shoot, I don't know. I've never seen this video before, obviously. And up until now, I was going to call this critter Epigallus rather than Ceratogallus. I still don't know if the name changed recently or what. Could be one of those situations that William Diller Matthew named it Ceratogallus a long, long time ago. Then it was rechristened Epigallus, and then it's reverted back for some reason. I don't actually know. But... Yeah. What's going on? What's going on with this? And just like in the digging hypothesis, their anatomy also gets in the way of them being able to use their horns to spar with each other. Because they use their yeah. heads to dig, these rodents tended to have a shortened, stiffened neck. Basically, the gophers wouldn't have been able to tilt their head down far enough to point their horns at their rival, especially in the species with the tallest horns. And as far as using the horns for display instead of actual combat, well, the female would have needed to actually see the horns or the victorious male to be impressed by them. But it looks like horned gophers actually had really poor eyesight, based on the size of the holes in the gopher's skull that the optic nerve would have passed through. This is also the problem with the idea that the horns were used by gophers to recognize other members of their species. If they couldn't see very well, a visual signal would have been pretty useless. And also, mammals tend not to do very much visual sig signaling like that unless they're primates. Because mammals tend to be fairly nose-driven. You know, like, mammals tend to have a really good sense of smell. And you can communicate a lot with smells if you're close enough. Mammals don't tend to have very good eyesight in general. So this is not surprising that these guys couldn't see very well. You know? Yeah. Then Axeman has an excellent question. Brief detour here. Axeman says, in evolution, do traits ever evolve that do not help survival, but are instead a random artifact of the DNA, which simply does not harm the animal? Yes. All the time. That's like a huge part of evolution. That's what we call genetic drift. So sometimes you've got different mutations that occur that don't really have a strong positive or negative effect. They're just kind of there. And, uh, yeah, it's like a huge amount of change over time. It's just genetic drift. So, yeah, yeah. So thank you, Axeman, for asking that. If you want, we can, we can watch a video on genetic drift after this. But let's try and finish this one first. I'm going to try and stay on topic a little bit better than, than usual on today's stream. Which brings us to the final hypothesis, defense go, against dinosaur predators. Dead. Remember huh. how we said the gophers got bigger over time? Well, it looks like these larger gophers probably spent more time foraging above ground than their smaller ancestors did. Hmm. And the Great Plains were only getting more open and grassy as the Miocene went on, providing even less cover for a rodent. And these things okay. put them at the mercy of potential predators. Throughout the middle and late Miocene, while the horned gophers were getting ever larger horns, new predators arrived and diversified in North America. The two groups that were most likely to have been a problem for the horned gophers were the skunks and badgers. These new oh. predators were semi-fossorial, so they would have had no problem going after burrowing rodents. Ah. Well, well, well. See, it turns out sometimes, just in the same way that, like, a submarine is the most uh dangerous enemy of another submarine 
a digging mammal can be the most dangerous enemy of another digging mammal. You know? So yeah, back to the badgers there, Claire Burr. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, interesting. So did those horns evolve as a defense against skunks and badgers? And a problem for the horned gophers were the skunks and badgers. These new predators were semi-fossorial, so they would have had no problem going after burrowing rodents. And their fossils are found in the same places as those of the horned gophers. The right. gophers also might have had to worry about death from above. Avian yeah. predators like hawks and other birds of prey have also been found at the same fossil sites as the horned gophers. As the gophers got larger and pressure from predators increased, their horns got taller. And these tall, robust horns could have been used both for protection and active defense by the gophers. Hmm. Lifting the head and tipping it backwards would have positioned the horns above the eyes and neck, helping to protect these vulnerable parts from predators trying to grab the gopher from above. By doing this hmm. quickly, using those powerful neck muscles, it could have been a forceful enough strike to deter a potential predator. And even hungry weasels don't like to get hit hard in the face. So it looks like the best hypothesis for why these rodents evolved horns was for defense. The last of the horned gophers, Ceratogallus hatcheri, survived in the grasslands of Nebraska and Kansas until the earliest part of the Pliocene epoch, around 5 million years ago. And there hasn't been a horned rodent since. Hmm. From the adaptations of their digging ancestors, the horned gophers evolved a truly unique defense mechanism, one that no other rodent ever has. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Let me give you a link to this video right here. And, uh, yeah, interesting, interesting. And you wonder why they went extinct? It's a good question, Dr. Irrefutable. I don't actually know how long they lasted. Let's take a look at that, shall we? Um, yeah, horned gopher. <laughs> uh, Ceratogallus. Which, that might actually be what the name Ceratogallus means. It might be Horned Gopher. It's Horned something. Cerato means Horned. Yeah. And how long did they last? I love these old reconstructions of the animals doing their fossorial thing. <laughs> Look at the size of the claws on them in this reconstruction, too. Their, their claws probably weren't that long in real life. Yeah. Um, cool stuff. And this basically just kind of rehashes the video that we were watching. Or rather, maybe the video was based largely on this Wikipedia article. Or maybe on the maybe on the primary sources. I don't know. Let's give them some credit. But check out that gorgeous fossil there. You've got the skull up top with those horns. And then they do have really sizable claws there. That's actually really impressive, the size of those claws. Yeah. You want claws like that, you gotta be a Therizinosaur or a turtle. Yeah. Some turtles also have crazy long claws like that. Yeah. Um. So when do they, when do they disappear? From the late Miocene to the early Pliocene. So it could be that climate change may have driven them into extinction. Because there were some climatic changes in, like, the middle Pliocene. I think that might be around the same time that, uh, like, Earth got colder. And you get the extinction of other groups, too. Like, Megalodon sharks, I think, go extinct during the mid-Pliocene. Yeah. Um, the global cooling that occurred during the Pliocene may have spurred on the disappearance of forests and the spread of grasslands and savannas. Okay. Um, but it was also during the Pliocene that you've got the the great American biotic interchange. South America and North America finally stop this will they won't they thing and they. They finally kiss right there at the Isthmus of Panama. But while that happens, ocean currents that used to be able to move through there stopped. And that changes global climates. 
it just kind of throws things off kilter globally. And so that, it could be that North America and South America joining right there may have led to the extinction of Ceratogallus, either through climate change or maybe through the invasion of species from South America coming north. I don't actually know. Yeah. Um, it's interesting stuff. And it, beards, no, Megalodon does not... St Believe me, if there were... Megalodon's an animal that's like, you know, it's got these enormous teeth. And if there were a population of Megalodon still alive anywhere in the world, we would be finding those teeth washing up on beaches and stuff. And we just don't. So yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah, yeah. Oh, and uh... Rat Finky says, apologies if this is a stupid question. I'm sure it's not. But if those horns were useful for defense, why have future species of gophers or rodents not developed them? Um, it might be because of like a size thing, you know? It might just be because other rodents are not suffi sufficiently large or maybe there's a different kind of predator. I don't know, actually, it's a good question. Traits like this, they don't always evolve if they're useful. A lot of evolution is kind of random chance. And... Yeah. Yeah. Even if a trait is really, really successful, if that group goes extinct, there's no guarantee that that trait will evolve in other groups later on. But it's a good question. It's a good question. And I've not done Metazoo yet. I forgot, Miss Yvette. Let's do that now. Shoot. Um... Let's get into... Metazoo here. This, if you haven't seen it before, is a guessing game online in which you try and guess the animal of the day. You type in a guess here, and then this will show you the, uh, the most exclusive evolutionary group that includes your guess in the day's mystery animal. So, given that today is Groundhog Day, let's start off with a groundhog and see if that gets us anywhere close. And oh boy, it did. Yes, yes, yes. You are Contoglyres. This is the primates and the rodents and their relatives. You are Contoglyres. So let's jump up from the Suolel 2. Let's go to Primates. Yeah. There's Primates there, and then there is Uarconta and Uarconto Glyres, which is the rodents, the primates, and their assorted relatives and allies. Uh, yeah. But, but, since I guessed Groundhog, which is a rodent, and it didn't give us Rodentia, we can tell that our mystery animal is not a rodent. It's not going to be part of Glyres either, so it's not going to be a lagomorph like a rabbit. It's going to be a primate or one of their relatives. So, we can take a right turn here or a left turn take a right turn to rodents and rabbits? Well, that doesn't make sense. It would have said Glyres or Rodentia or whatever. Instead, we know it's within Uarconta. It's going to be one of the primates or their relatives. Primates, lemurs, tree, shoe, tree shrews, etc. So, chat, give me the name of a primate and, uh, and we'll guess that. I think that's our best course of action here. Um... I'm seeing a lot of, I'm seeing some people saying lemur. Let's try lemur. And see if that gets us closer. Okay, it is a primate, but it's not a lemur. So, what can we tell here? This is not gonna be part of Strepsorhini. It's not gonna be part of the lemur family or lemur group, lemur formates. Not part of the lemur clade. It's instead going to be some kind of monkey, ape, or tarsier here.
So why don't we go to old world monkeys' names? Give me the name of a monkey or ape like this. Let's try gorilla. Lannister Davis says gorilla. Let's try that. And, ho, 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 ho. oh, we are close. We are very close. It's some kind of hominid. Yeah. So, this is hominoidia. And then we can go into hominidae, the great apes. So we know it's some kind of great ape, but not a gorilla. So it's either going to be an orangutan... Or a chimp, or a bonobo, or a human. Yeah. I'm seeing people say bonobo. Let's try bonobo, I guess. And, nope. Not a bonobo. It's outside of Hominine. Oh, boy. Chat, do you know what this means? Do you know what it has to be? It's a hominid, but not a hominin. That gives us only one option here. So, this is Hominine. We know it's not in here. It's not an African ape. But it is a hominid, a great ape. So what is the only one that is not a member of the African apes that's still a great ape? Lordy says human. Will62 says Jeff Bezos. No. Humans are African apes. See? Yeah. Homo sapiens are one of the African apes. What's a great ape that's not an African ape? It's gotta be... an orangutan. It's gotta be. So let's try that chat. Um... Yeah, here. It's gotta be, right? Right? Final answer, let's say... Orangutan? Hold on to your butts. And... Yes, indeed. Yeah. Good stuff. It's an orangutan. Not too shabby. Yeah, so we got that in five guesses. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, I, we did about as well as we could have here. You know? It's very rare that you can get it in any any fewer than, like, six or seven guesses. So five is pretty darn good, you know? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Here, let's maybe watch a quick video on orangutans. And then we'll get back to our rodent friends. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah. Let's see, let's try, let's try this one. these mammals. Yeah. So this actually is an orangutan driving a golf cart. This is not fake. It's not a hoax. Yeah, 
Cast the Dreamer says, Surely an animal that's smart enough to drive a go-kart could have a job and pay taxes. So, there's actually a, uh, <laughs> I love this. Uh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> There's actually a, uh, Apparently, like a, a folk belief, which is probably more of a joke than anything else, but it's like a folk belief in uh, in Indonesia that orangutans are just, you know, they're just guys. You know, it's like yeah, we're people. They're people too. You know, um, but they're a little bit more clever in the sense that, you know, of course they can talk. They can do everything that we can, but they just choose to keep quiet. Because they know. Uh, they know that if anybody hears them talking, they will immediately, like, give them a job and then they'll have to go to work and pay taxes and everything else. Um, I always thought that was a really charming idea, you know? Because it's, it's kind of respectful of those creatures. It's like, yeah, you know, they're, they're a lot like us. They're just, you know, they don't want to deal with all this nonsense. <laughs> Fair enough. But yeah, yeah. And, uh... But yeah, yeah. I've seen one use a hand saw. Yeah, Will 6-2. They're, they're pretty impressive in the way that orangutans... Hello, friends. Oh, goodness. No, we're not going to watch this. It's a clickbait video. But yeah. And the same event motion. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome. I found te my team found a Diaplosaurus skeleton that appears to have a joint near its mouth. Oh, very funny. Same event motion. Why'd you come up with Diaplosaurus? Um, that's funny. I thought you were serious about that for a second. Diaplosaurus is, uh, if I'm thinking of the one I think I'm thinking of, it's only been found in Utah, and it's a pretty rare sauropod dinosaur. But yeah, yeah. Anyway. Um. But yeah. I remember reading about an orangutan who escaped his enclosure from keeping a key under his lip. Interesting. Orangutans are really, really interesting animals. And let's just watch a quick video on them before the we get back to is our, our closest relatives. Rodent so topic why for the are we pushing them to extinction? Oh boy. Hi, I'm Danielle, and you're watching Animal Logic. Orangutans are members of the great ape family, and their genus is separated into three species: the Bornean, the Sumatran, and the Tapanuli orangutans. Their huh. subfamily used to contain several other members, including the Gigantopithecus, which is the largest primate in the fossil record and could stand yep. up to three meters tall. Orangutans are found in the rainforests of- By the way, voiced by Christopher Walken in a, in a Disney film, Gigantopithecus. Did you not? Um. There we go. <laughs> yeah, bizarre, but but fun. Anyway, that's Gigantopithecus, which I don't know if we have fossil evidence of it coming from India, but it was still cool. He he does mention Gigantopithecus repeatedly in that song, actually. Um, yeah. Yeah, here we go.
Yeah. Um. Anyway, Gigantopithecus, interesting critter. It's not like I need to sleep anyway. There you go, Mr. Jiglocta. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Nell says, from India, yes, but not during the time Jungle Book is set. I thought Gigantopithecus was only known from, uh, from, like, China and then parts of Southeast Asia. I didn't know it was known from India, too. Um. Yeah, here. Southern China from 2 million to 300,000 years ago in the early to middle Pliocene. Pleistocene. Um, potential identifications have also been found in Thailand, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Yeah, not not India as far as I know. Um, here's a link if you want to read that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, in Disney CGI remakes, I know, Charlie's Dragon, they're never any good. But they're never any good as movies, but like it is kind of cool to, to see really realistic CGI animals, I guess. In that sense, they are like cooler than the original animated ones because there is like actual real attention to detail in the creature designs that there isn't in, uh, in like a lot of the original animated Disney films. Um, yeah. Yeah, here, let me show you an example from the film The Lion King. Just like, you know, it's pretty egregious one particular error here. Uh, and you're gonna go, well, you know, Danny, why are you, you're saying this about a you know, an animated feature. Like, oh, well, actually, those animals can't really talk or sing. The facts don't care about your feelings. That's not what I'm trying to say here. There's, like, actually a pretty egregious error in this. And I think some of you will be surprised by it. But uh, it's when they've got the big stack of animals. Let's see... Right about here, I think. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and no, the, the idea is not, oh, you, like, oh, big stack of animals. They can't do that. There it is. You see it? Did you see it? Did anybody catch it? Did anybody catch it right there? Pretty egregious mistake. Yeah, Claire Burr already knows. Yes, indeed. Yeah. You've got giant anteaters there. They do not and have never existed on the African continent. Anteaters are from South America. They have always been South American. You've got all of these other wonderful African megafauna and other mammals here. Wrong continent for anteaters. Wrong continent. They're beautifully animated, and, like, good job on that. Like, it's cool design and everything. Totally the wrong continent. Anteaters are South American. I've not seen any glaring errors like that in, uh, in the Jungle Book movie when I saw the, the new CGI remake. In fact, I was actually really impressed with their animals overall. It would have been really cool to see Garials. I didn't spot any Garials. I don't remember seeing any Garials in it. That would have been really cool. Missed opportunity. But, um, but yeah. All of the, the Indian animals in that, really well rendered. I liked it a lot. And that, from that respect. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe they were going for Aardvarks? Maybe it said Aardvarks in the script or something, Stavros, because Aardvarks are afro -theers. They are from Africa. But aardvarks aren't quite as photogenic as giant anteaters. I'll say it. They're not. They just... They don't have the same kind of prettiness about them. Sorry, Arthur. But they're just not as, uh... 
you know. They just don't have the same kind of elegance as, uh, as a giant anteater does. Anywho, yeah, they are cute. They are cute, but it's a different kind of look, you know. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I guess I just really like anteaters. I think they're really neat. But yeah, yeah. Worst anteater I've seen was in the game Cuphead, game known for amazing artwork. You should look it up. I saw Ios play that. She beat that game on stream. Um. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, this is, you know, this is supposed to be like a 1930s art style. But, yeah, that's not very good. Like, it... But it's not supposed to be, you know? He's wearing a hat, for crying out loud. And he's got, like, a vacuum nozzle nose. That's a little bit different from, from this, you know, where they're rendered more or less realistically. And, like, they look cool here. This is wrong continent, you know? Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. Anywho, Ant and Aardvark cartoon. I don't never even heard of that. I don't think. Yeah. And Rat Finky says, "Are we serious?" So this is the thing, Rat Finky. This is like, oh boy, I wish we had like. Sometimes I wish that media criticism were, like, a required subject in schools. But I'm not getting mad at this. It's just, like, it's it's weird that they put all of this effort... They must have had a team of animators, like, looking at modern animals, going to zoos, taking video footage to, like, get the walk cycles right and everything. And, like, they clearly put a lot, a lot, a lot of effort into this. And yet they could make such a basic, simple error, like... You know, this is like putting tigers in this movie. You know, it's set out on the African savanna. You know? It would be like having a polar bear. You know, walking across the veldt. It's that basic of an error, you know? Yeah. So, I don't know. I don't know. It's... But I guess the fact that it slipped through showed that, like, it just shows how little people know about anteaters. You know? Yeah. Sorry, just being flippant. No worries, Rat Finky. No, no worries. And I didn't mean to jump down your throat about that, so I apologize, too. Um, yeah. Uh, here, supposed to be consistent. There you go, Amberfix. That's a good way to put it. There's a suspension of disbelief with animals acting like people that's different from the layer of what animals live in the region, which here is supposed to be consistent. Thank you, Ebervix. Well said. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Yeah. And they put so much effort in animating the animals, right? I bet you they did, Charlie's Dragon. I'm, I'm kind of assuming. You know, like when... You, you might be surprised by the amount of, like, work and attention that goes into to animating stuff like this. Even, like, in, um... Here. Um... The, uh... AT, at walkers. In The Empire Strikes Back. Animated by Phil Tippett. This is stop motion animation, animating them frame by frame. And I'm pretty sure, maybe we can even find a clip. Phil Tippett like went to uh, the Oakland Zoo, I think. Or maybe it was Marine World. And he like observed the elephants walking because he wanted to have like a believable walk cycle for something really, really big that's walking around on four legs. And so this is like a totally fictional thing. These machines don't exist, except here in his workshop. But... 
you know, in order to make something look convincing and not be distracting, not take you out of a movie like that as a viewer, animators have to do a tremendous amount of work. And that's something that I really respect. Um, let's see. Let's try this, maybe? Yeah. And let's go to the AT-ATs. There's the Tauntauns. But projected at the proper speed, 24 frames per second, these individual movements will flow seamlessly together. Yeah. They're actually models which can be carried in the palm of your hand. Huh. They were filmed against background paintings and snowscapes months later. The models came in several sizes to match the scale of different live action shots. The artificial snow is made out of baking soda and micro. Oh, and I totally agree, Gotini. I totally agree. I was just, I was searching for something to, one tiny sliver of a silver lining for the, the CGI remakes, which, um, actually at this point, I think I've only seen the Jungle Book. I haven't seen the Lion King remake. I should, maybe, see if it's any good at all. The 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 Jungle Book one was very forgettable, except for that weird song by Christopher Walken, which is very memorable, and like it is what it is, I guess. But the the animals, I thought, just as somebody who studies animals and who's enthusiastic about animals, that's what I liked. Does that justify the existence of those movies? I don't know, you know. There is something, like, kind of weird and cynical and gross about, like, just reusing these IPs, as people call them, intellectual property, and, like, you know, let's not do anything original, and let's not, let's just rehash stuff that's come before, and there is something kind of gross about that, you know? So I think, I think we'd probably agree on that front. Um, but yeah. And Rico Dactylus says, any song by Christopher Walken will be weird almost by definition. Yeah. Yeah. It took nine months to design and build these models. Yeah. Dennis and Gotini, I agree. Stop motion yeah. photography. Yeah. The animator is John Bird. Does, I wonder if they talk Once about the again, elephants here. Each articulated part of the model must be moved. No more than a fraction of an inch between each single frame exposure in these stop motion sequences. Yeah. Amazing the attention. Animator shot Yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> this is exactly what I wanted. Oh, man. I didn't think we were going to have it. Yeah, check it out. Stop motion sequences. Yeah. The animators shot motion studies of animals in order to perfect the movements of their models. Oh, it's even more involved than I remember. Look at that. Followed in this elephant's footsteps. <laughs> Yeah. Because the live action footage was finished before most of the special effects were completed, animated sketches, animatics, of the finished sequence were made. They served as moving blueprints for the film editor and the effects people. Orchestration, an artful blending of all the elements in a sequence, is everything in a film like Empire. So anyway, the important part was the elephants. Yeah. Um... Good stuff. And also, when we're talking about AT-ATs, well, I, I once had a, an argument with my old crew chief, Denver Fowler, about whether they should be called AT-ATs, which is how I grew up saying them, or AT-AT, uh, as Denver said they should be called. And, you know, let's do a quick poll right here, because why not? Here... AT, AT pronunciation. Um, AT, AT, doing that phonetically, or at, at. What do you think, chat? Let me know. 
I was having a an argument with Denver about this at 4th of July in 2013, I think it was. Yeah, 2013. Um, in Livingston, Montana. And we're like arguing about this and we look over and I went, oh, holy cow. We actually have an opportunity to learn this once and for all to get the real answer. Because standing right there was Joe Johnston, a uh, Hollywood director. He uh, would sometimes join us in the field. Um, he worked on the Star Wars series. He designed the AT-ATs for, uh, for The Empire Strikes Back. He also like designed Boba Fett and Ewoks and like a bunch of other Star Wars things. Like So much of what makes Star Wars cool actually came from Joe Johnston. And so I asked him, and I'll tell you what he said. But let's look at our results here. And AT-80 has one out here at 62%. At 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 38%. I'm sure I I biased this experiment. This this poll here by the way that I pronounce it. But uh here, let me find that photo. I'll show you when Joe Johnson was joining us. So this is back when I worked with Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. And Joe Johnson also directed Jurassic Park 3. He, he also directed, like, Jumanji and um, October Sky and, uh, and uh, one of those Marvel movies. I forget which one. Um, but uh, anyway, when he was when he directed Jurassic Park 3 he got to know Jack Horner my old boss who was the scientific consultant on the Jurassic Park films and uh, and so yeah he joined us for our our little 4th of July celebration uh, in Livingston Montana and I've got let's see I've got photos we set up this uh, trebuchet thing. This was Kerry Woodruff's that he he put together. And so we had this on the back of a trailer, this trebuchet. And then we were launching watermelons with it, but we needed a target for that. And so somebody handed me some cardboard and a Sharpie, and they're like, Danny, you're artsy. Why don't you make a, uh, a target for us? And so, here's, <laughs> here's Denver right here, not pleased about this. Uh, somebody's like, oh, no, Carrie Woodruff, who's, uh, we've talked about him, a dinosaur paleontologist. Carrie's like, Danny, make a, make a castle for us out of this cardboard and write England on it. And Denver, who is from England, was not very happy about this. But there was a lot of, like, you know, it's 4th of July, American Revolution, and everything else. Denver was not happy. So I, uh, I put this together. Um, oh, Britain, I guess is what I wrote on it. Sorry, that's such a blurry photo. But, uh... Yeah, that's better. That's Joe Johnson setting that up. My crummy cardboard castle. Joe Johnston, the guy who invented AT-ATs and, and Boba Fett and everything else. He was such a good sport. He was going and trying to like set this up where the trebuchet would actually hit it with the watermelons. Um, yeah. And he would shout back, you know, a little bit more to the left, or <laughs> whatever. Um, it was, it was really something. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I embarrassed myself later because Denver and I are having this argument. And I turn and I go, well, we've got a golden opportunity here. Why don't we ask... She, Joe invented these, right? And I'm like, Joe... Settle a, you know, settle a dispute here. You know, are they called... Did you call them AT-ATs? 
Or did you call them at-ats? And I felt so stupid after this. Because Joe kind of clammed up. And you kind of got the sense he's like, oh no, not one of these discussions. And he goes, you know what? Uh, I don't know. He didn't say, you know what? He just went, well, you know, I, we we just called them snow walkers. <laughs> he like, did not want to be drawn into this argument. <laughs> I felt so bad. Uh, yeah, yeah. But... Yeah, yeah. It's funny, because that's what they call him here in this featurette, too. Murin does the stop-motion photography. The animator yeah. is John Bird. Um... to match the scale. They were filmed against bat, which can be carried. came in several made out of baking soda. And... Dennis Murin does the stop-motion yeah. photography. Anyway, Joe Johnson might even John appear in Bird. some of these shots. Maybe. I'm not sure. But Dennis Muren also worked on Jurassic Park, too. Once again, each articulated part of the model must be moved. Which was no like more than a fraction of an what, inch. 13 years later single or single frame exposure in these yeah. stop motion sequences. Don't they call them Imperial Walkers at one point? In the, the dialogue of the film, they do. Studies yeah. of animals in order to perfect the movements of their models. Yeah. The Snow Walkers followed in this... Snow Walkers. Steps. There you go. So, yeah. Cool stuff. Anyway. I don't remember where we were or what we were talking about. Oh, it was orangutans. Well, I feel like that ship has sailed. Um, let's get back to rodents, shall we? In celebration of Groundhog Day, let's get back to discussing rodents. Chicken walkers are my favorites. Yeah, the ATSTs. Are there at stas? That's my. If you're gonna call them at ats, the you know the big imperial walkers, what do you call the chicken walkers? Do you call them at stas? This you call them scout walkers. But yeah. Anyway. And Pope says, have you ever seen an elephant shrew's funny nose? I have, but yeah. You bet. Yes. And actually, so I've got an opportunity to go run to the bathroom. Why don't I show you some elephant shrews? As we're speaking about movies, has anybody here seen or heard of the movie 65? With a Star Wars alum himself, Adam Driver? Have you heard of that film, 65? He, like, crash lands a spaceship on Earth, but it's 65 million years ago? Well, I did, like, a parody trailer of that that I'd like to show you. Um, it is, uh... Well, yeah, the thing is, the movie is called 65, because it's supposed to be like, oh, yeah, 65 million years ago, the asteroid struck and, and killed the dinosaurs. But that part's wrong. <laughs> well, like, it's outdated. We used to say 65 million years ago, but we've got more reliable dating methods now that are much more precise, and now we know that Asteroid hit 66 million years ago, which kind of messes things up for the movie, and uh, you'll see that here in this trailer while I go around to the little paleontologist room. I'll be right back. Enjoy. Charter 373. This is Commander Mills. My ship was hit by an undocumented asteroid. Sounds 
send help. We've crash landed on an uncharted celestial body. The atmosphere is breathable. There's something alien out there. <laughs> so there's that yeah um yeah yeah you know they could have avoided that that parody there if they just named it 66 uh, <laughs> that was a lot of fun putting that together it really was but yeah please don't call Elfland and Shrew's noses silly they're well, they're they're very cute. Yeah. And Pope says, "Did you know they are not actually they are actually a type of elephant, not a rodent?" Well, they're definitely not a rodent. So you're right about that. But they're not an elephant either. They belong to a group called Afrotheria. Let me show you. On our tree of life here. Yeah. Um. Afrotheria. So they're closely related to elephants, or they're at least part of Afrotheria. Um, but yeah, the the really, like, more proper name for elephant shrews is Sangis. Sangis, because they're neither elephants nor are they shrews. But they are related to elephants. Elephants, elephant shrews, and more within Afrotheria. So that also includes manatees and dugongs are part of this group as well. And golden moles and tenrex. And critter we were talking about a few minutes ago. The aardvark. Where's the aardvark? Where do our aardvarks go? Aardvarks! Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Aardvarks are also kind of afro -theer. So aardvarks and elephants are more closely related to each other than they are to, I don't know, rhinoceros or hippos or something. Rhinoceros and hippos are way over in another group. Hippos are closer to whales. Rhinoceros are closer to horses and tapirs. Yeah. So yeah. Elephants, elephant shrews, and more. Sengis is uh, probably a better name for elephant shrews, but elephant shrew is the one that most people know. Sengi might be from their native Africa, from a, a language there. But, um... Let's see... Yeah. Here, check this out. Take. Good stuff. Good stuff. Anyway, those guys are not rodents. Sengis might look rodent-like, but they are not rodents, as uh, as Pope was pointing out. Yeah. Here, check them out. Got that little trunk-like nose. This might look like a mouse. It is nowhere close to a mouse on the Tree of Life. 
I guess it's an example of what we call convergent evolution, where like... Or it's not even that. It's more like this is the default state for a mammal, you know? This is similar to like what some of the first mammals looked like. The most basic state for a mammal is to be small and shrew-like. And that's, uh... That's what these guys are like. I was talking with Joan Embry and, uh... And what else she has? Joan? We had a tree out here a moment ago. And, oh, not again. We were talking about the, this is the snake lady this is yesterday. Close, this is As an archetype. Oh, I think I know what that is. It's an insectivore. That is a... with a Oh, boy! Holy cow. So this is from what year? Johnny Carson. Uh... She said insectivore. Insectivora is a now defunct group of mammals. We used to think that it included things like hedgehogs and elephant shrews and maybe rodents also. I don't I don't know. But nowadays we realize those critters are not actually very closely related to each other at all. So insectivora like that is it's it's not what it used to be, you know? Yeah. A shrew? A shrew. A shrew. This is a elephant shrew. See the, the trunk or the nose? Yeah, it looks like a small... It has nostrils at the very end of the tip of that, that nose. Right. Where does a shrew come from? They come from East Africa, the elephant shrews. Shrews no. come from quite a large range. And these... Yeah, so these guys are not actually related to shrews. Elephant shrews are not a kind of shrew. They're not quite a kind of elephant either, but they're they're much closer to elephants than they are to shrews. So... We've got elephants, elephant shrews, and more right here in Afrotheria. But to get to shrews, I think shrews might actually be rodent? No. Let's find out. I'm having a, a brain fart at the moment. There we go, shrews. They're related to hedgehogs, I think. Yeah, they are not rodents. Yeah. Um... Yeah, Sarissidae. Some of these guys... I was gonna say are... Venomous, but I might be thinking of another critter that's called a shrew that is not actually a shrew. Man, if they live in Cuba, what are they called? Um... Uh... Uh, Saludrone... Not Tamarin, no. Uh, good guess, though, reanimated Brit. Um, Selenodon. Selenodon is what I'm thinking of. They are venomous. Selenodon. Yeah. Selenodons are over there, yeah. So they are still within Insectivora. But these guys are... Venomous. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Celine Dion is venomous. There you go, check nerd. If you learn nothing else from this stream, learn that Celine Dion is venomous. Her heart might go on, but yours won't when she injects you with her deadly venom. Yeah. Here, take a look. Just because venom is common doesn't mean it isn't weird. Like if venom wasn't a thing and I told you, hey, what if there was an animal that had teeth like hypodermic needles that injected an extremely complex cocktail of chemicals into another animal's blood specifically to harm or kill them? That'd be a wild idea. But it turns out injecting a substance into another animal to harm them is super useful. So it has evolved yep. a bunch of times. Snakes, spiders, jellyfish, snails, Northern fish, short -tail cephalopods, really, Hugo? all That's common venomous varieties. But just based yeah. on sheer Sheer numbers alone, you're and much venomous less shrews likely too, really? to have encountered a venomous mammal, which do exist. Yeah. There just aren't that many of them, and we're still not exactly sure why that is. Though it looks like this adaptation evolved independently in each venomous mammal species. Whatever the reason, being a member of this small club of or venomous mammals definitely makes you a bizarre beast. Yeah, cool. 
Today, our venomous mammal of choice is an enigmatic shrew-like creature called the Selenodon. They might actually yeah. be the largest living venomous terrestrial mammal at around one kilogram, and they're pretty rare. One of the two species was even thought to have gone extinct by the 1970s until it was yeah, rediscovered so. in 2003. Today, they're only huh. found on the Caribbean islands of Hispaniola and Cuba. They're nocturnal yeah. omnivores, and they mostly eat arthropods, like insects. But they're not picky. They'll also eat fruit, small vertebrates, and bird eggs, given the option. And some of the things they eat like millipedes are even kind of poisonous. Now, just to help keep things straight, the difference between venom and poison lies in the delivery system. Venom yep. is actively injected, while poison is more passively absorbed, either through the skin or by inhaling or swallowing it. And so yeah, so yeah, the the so, shorthand that I've always used. Dinosaurs became extinct because they no longer knew how to love each other. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. What? Exactly. And I certainly wouldn't want our species to end the same way. Well, let me caution. Hello to the chat Let me caution. Thank you so much for the eight months of support. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's good to have you here. Thank you for supporting me for the past eight months. Let me caution. You know how much I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, so the shorthand that I've always used is that venom is injected. It's got like an, an injection delivery system, whether it's fangs or spines or something like that. Poison is like secreted, you know? You can lick a poisonous frog and then die. But a venomous rattlesnake has got to bite you, sink its fangs into you, deliver its venom that way. And yes, animals can be both venomous and poisonous. The blue ringed octopus, for example, will envenomate you if it gets a chance, but if it fails and you eat it, it will also poison you. Unlike venomous snakes, uh. whose fangs can be found in their upper jaws, selenodons inject their venom through specialized lower incisor teeth, which have deep huh. grooves connected to venom glands at the base of the teeth. So we know the how of the selenodon venom delivery system. But why the selenodon is venomous in the first place is still unclear. It's been suggested that the venom helps them capture prey or avoid becoming prey, or it might even be used against other selenodons for within species competition of some kind. At the very uh -huh. least, we're pretty sure it works on other selenodons. In one paper from 1959, a researcher reported that Hispaniolan selenodons kept in captivity together had high death rates, apparently caused yeah, by right. biting each other's feet. A group of researchers Oof. recently did a deep dive into the composition of the selenodon's venom to try to figure out what it's made of and whether it's related to the venoms of other mammals. They found that the venom is mostly made up of proteins called colicrians, enzymes that cut the chemical bonds in certain other proteins. And chopping up longer proteins into shorter proteins is a thing that happens in our bodies all the time, except in this case, those shorter proteins cause low blood pressure in vertebrates. That doesn't sound so bad, but eventually, blood pressure gets low enough that the blood can't, like, get to the brain and the animal slows or dies. This supports yeah. the idea that the selenodon's venom is used for capturing prey, not for defending itself against predators. Most anti-predator venom works by being immediately painful, not mm. by the slower-acting effect of lowering blood pressure. The researchers then compared the selenodon's venom and the genes that code for it to those of three different kinds of shrews, which are huh. also members of the ultra-exclusive Venomous Mammals Club, to see where it came from. Now, selenodons split... Uh, hang on, Rat Finky's... I've never heard of this before, but that's really cool. I always remembered which is which, venom versus poison, by thinking about their first letter. V looks sharp and is therefore injected. I love that, Ratfinky. I love that. Oh man. Can I can I use that? I'd love to be able to use that as a teaching tool in the future. Um that's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh nice. And Celtic Elephant says Selenodons seem like the type of mammal to survive a mass extinction and then rapidly speciate. Just my thoughts. I mean, that's what mammals did when they looked like this, when they survived the KPG extinction event. Yeah. Here's a of course step you can. Thank you, Red Fang. To becoming a fossil. Oh. Step one, die. Iconic song. What an iconic alert there. Thank you for the 14 months of support, Iconic Song. That means a lot to me. Thank you, thank you. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, and the P in poison looks like a tongue. It does, Lenina. In emoji speak, or in emoticon speak, rather. 
like a colon and then a p yeah it's like a tongue sticking out like you lick something that's poisonous yeah i like that i like that that's great, actually. That's great. I'm going to remember this, and I'm going to use it when I'm explaining this concept in the future. Split off from the ancestors of shrews, moles, and hedgehogs over 70 million years ago in yeah. the Cretaceous period, and those are their closest living relatives. So yeah, huh. Selenodon's been doing their own thing since the days of the dinosaurs. But when you're an evolutionary biologist, your default hypothesis when you see the same adaptation in several species within a group is that it came from a common ancestor, even if that common ancestor was 70 million years ago. Except in this case, huh. it didn't. Based on the differences in the structure of genes that code for the venom proteins, it yeah. looks like the ability to produce venom evolved independently in all three of the shrews and in the selenodon. But whoa, whoa, whoa. it was a twist. While the evolution of venom in each genus was an independent event, all four of them converged on the same kind of venom. Because like in the huh. selenodon, the venom in the shrews is mostly made up of calicreans, just slightly different numbers and versions of them. And here's how that probably happened. Calicreans are actually found in the saliva of lots of mammals, including really you. Mean. So the ancestors yeah. of the selenodon and the shrews likely started off with the same raw material that would eventually become venom. Over time, slightly different random mutations happened in the genes that coded for those enzymes in the lineage of each animal. That so I guess the idea here is that it is convergent evolution? But kind of just barely. Like, remember we were talking about this, was it yesterday or the day before? And trying to tell the difference between homology and convergent evolution? That the farther away the animals are from each other, the less closely related they are, the easier it is to tell if it's convergence or homology. This is one of those things where it kind of, like, gets blurry. Is this convergent evolution, like, independently evolving the same trait from different ancestors? Well, shoot, these guys actually have a common ancestor not too long ago. And so... I guess it's part homology and part convergence. Interesting stuff. The variation meant that natural selection could happen. Like the Selenodon or Shrew that happened to make more Calicreans or slightly different ones was better at bringing down prey, which meant that more energy could be turned into babies, who then also could carry those same mutations for more effective venom. And on and on mm. it went like that for generations, because that's how evolution works. There is no ideal form that it's going towards. Natural selection can only act on the variations that exist. And today, yeah. the end result is we have two groups of mammals separated by 70 million years of evolution who ended up with really similar weird mammal venoms. They just got there slightly differently. For more on the evolution of venom, check cool out the stuff. episode of PBS Eons coming next week, where Bizarre Beasts host Sarah Suda will be talking venomous mammals and their fossil relatives with Blake DiPestino. To celebrate that collaboration... Very neat, very neat. Well, here's a link to that video right there. And this also... I had another thought as well and it's that selenodons should totally become maybe the new uh like archetypical mesozoic mammal in films and stuff sometimes when you're making a documentary about dinosaurs be it like walking with dinosaurs or something like that um Occasionally, you'll use a real live mammal as a stand-in for a Mesozoic mammal. So, um... Yeah... Here, let's... Oh boy, this is one of those things where they... Uh, here, I'll embiggen this, I guess, so that we can see the part that we need to see. But this is one of those things where they try and escape getting copyright struck uh, on YouTube by adding a crazy background and, like, chopping and screwing the footage. But let's find the part with the mammal that the Leal and Asora are encountering. Which I think was... I want to say it was early on.
Maybe not. But they used a live mammal. No, that's a Tuatara. That's not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is... They used a modern mammal here. Alongside these dinosaur puppets. And where is that? No. Let's see. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to find it. But it was a Quadamundi that they filmed alongside these dinosaur puppets um, as like a stand-in for a modern mammal, and I'm not going to be able to find it quickly enough. But, uh, yeah. And likewise, you saw in that clip earlier, the 65 parody trailer, there was that bug-eyed opossum crawling its way out from under that dinosaur skeleton. Like, that's... You know, a real modern mammal they just put on camera because opossums we think look kind of similar to some of the m mammals that lived during the Mesozoic era, during the age of the dinosaurs. My point here is that I've never seen a Selenodon being used in that capacity before. And that would be really cool because, like, it's a weird looking mammal and it, it just looks kind of superficially Mesozoic, which makes a lot of sense because these seem to have diverged from shrews. Like, way back during the Cretaceous period. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I would like to see these guys used in documentaries more, but they are probably pretty rare, and they might even be endangered. Here. Selenodons. Yeah, this one is endangered. Cuba. But this one, the Haitian Selenodon, is doing quite well. I'm, I bet you you could get a bunch of those on camera. Yeah, interesting. Um, but yeah, yeah. And I'm sure they're not that dangerous, Claire Burr. I don't think their venom is gonna is gonna kill the film crew. But uh, let's it on Paradoxus. Let's let's see. Uh, discovery, behavior, reproduction, ecology, evolution. References. We don't have a subheading for venom, but although the exact chemical composition of the venom is unknown, injection of 0.38 to 0.55 milligrams of venom per gram of body mass has been shown to be fatal to mice in two to six minutes. I don't think they're considered dangerous to people. Um, but looking at this, the composition of this photograph right here, they might be dangerous to Blair Witches. In fact, they probably feed on Blair Witches, I'm guessing. Uh, maybe other kinds of witches as well. <laughs> it's Spinoticus. Hey, I'll see you next time. Thank you for being here. You have a great weekend, huh? Yeah. Um, and Reese Dega says, the other sounds like it is out of Cuba. That would limit USA access. You know, I say, as a red-blooded American, I say, we as Americans need access to these Selena dogs for our dinosaur documentaries as stand-ins for Mesozoic mammals. We should end the embargo on Cuba as a result of that. Or or in order to get access to those Selenodons. Let's have some Selenodon diplomacy. How's that sound? The US embargo of Cuba is absolutely criminal in the first place. We should never have done it. Just, uh... Yeah. Um... There was an effort made to... to normalize relations with Cuba fairly recently, but I think that has been reversed... Sometime more recently. 
Anyway, it is absurd, Lenin. It's absolutely absurd. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, speaking of Cuba and other Caribbean islands, well, let's get back to our discussion for Groundhog Day here. Um, here we go. Happy Groundhog Day, everybody. And as we are discussing rodents, I wanted to show you this. This was something that I really enjoyed as a kid. It's from an old show called Paleo World, which was my very, very favorite television show when I was a child because it actually featured real paleontologists and real fossil science, sometimes in fairly niche areas. This is maybe the most niche of them. Uh, check it out. On a tiny island in the Caribbean, there once lived a rat twice the size of a man. Not actually a rat, it's but a rodent. Its very existence is a nightmare and a mystery. The answer is guarded by a death trap, a murky chasm that leads into the unknown depths and unmapped past of the island of giant rats. Yeah! <laughs> oh man. Please rise for the Paleo World Anthem. <laughs> this song, holy cow. Still gets me right here. Yeah. Yeah. One of the tiniest jewels in the Caribbean Sea is Anguilla. <laughs> called the Rock. <laughs> it's a, it's a lump of limestone <laughs> covering just 34 square And there you go, Rat Finky, yeah. yeah. Its long, thin shape accounts for its name. It's Anguilla eel. is Spanish for eel. Yeah. <laughs> but perhaps... And Ken is here. Is named for Ken, how are you doing? Welcome back, Ken. Howdy, howdy. It's been a while. Happy New Year to you, Ken. I... Have you been here since, uh... Oh, hang on. I... Since the camera stopped working? Let's, let's fix that real quick, shall we? That's better. Goodness. Ken, have you been here since uh, since I moved? New digs here. Yeah. Um, got a modular background now. I've moved in with Ios and Lordy. And things have been great. Except this camera's not auto-focusing properly. There we go. That's a little better. Yeah. Uh, happy Groundhog Day to you, Ken. We're talking about rodents as a celebration for Groundhog Day today. And we're about to talk about Amblyriza, a giant genus of capybara-like rodent that used to live in the Caribbean. I think it was first described by Edward Drinker Cope. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, very rustic. Thanks, Ken. I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah. Anyway. Great to see you, Ken. Um, for those of you who are not aware, uh, Ken is a member of my field crew from last summer. Uh, and before that, he was also, he attended the same conference that I did in Salt Lake City back in June. So Ken also works on fossils, and uh, he's a good guy to know. He's a stand-up guy. Uh, so anyway... Ken, did, uh, did Ethan tell you we're, looks like we've got a green light for, like, beginning of June this year in Wyoming? Yeah. Uh, anyway. Good stuff. And two of Team Degu are watching. Nice, Risu Degu. Awesome. Yeah. Uh. Anyway. Can't wait for more live dig site streams. Yeah, Lenina. It's going to be great. Oh, and uh, hang on. Did I even mention this yet? Ethan is going to be a special guest on Monday's stream. 
I don't think I even put that on the schedule yet, did I? Did I? Oh, I did, yeah. Paleontologist interview with Ethan Cowgill of the Utah Geological Survey. We're gonna be uh, having the first of this year's paleontologist interviews, which hopefully will be a weekly thing. Um, we'll be having the first of those on Monday. That is gonna be awesome. So yeah, yeah, good stuff. And those Partner Plus dollars already working? I haven't gotten any of the Partner Plus money yet, but it will be arriving. And so uh, we're going to put it to good use there. Yeah. Anywho, uh, Ambleriza is the critter that we're talking about. Ambleriza inundata, also known as the blunt-toothed giant Hushia. Or Hutia? I don't actually know how to pronounce that. It's not actually Hutia. It's related to other kinds of mammals. Uh, other kinds of rodents. Um, like, um... What it's related to is... Well, I'll show you in a little bit. Let's get back to Paleo World here. Uh... For the wrong creature. You have the last week of June off from work already? Beautiful, Cad. Years ago, oh, that's going to be the excellent. The king of Anguilla's yes. jungle was a rat as big as a bear. Yeah. Fascinated by this prehistoric mystery, three fossil hunters set out to find the giant rodent called Amblerisa. Huh. Donald McFarland is a biologist from Claremont College in California. Get the bigger bits here. <laughs> Ross McPhee is a mammologist from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Huh. Claire Fleming is his research assistant. Ah, uh, Claire. This is the end of a journey that began when two scientists each read of an ancient rodent almost a thousand times bigger than a modern rat. Both wondered how an animal so large could thrive on an island so small. They and they have very soft fur. Think like disappear. more capybara than rat. There is a great deal of romance to paleontology, and to hear about a rodent that was the size of a bear interested me greatly. I had to go and find it for myself. In the Caribbean, most fossils have been worn away by sun and rain, except those sheltered in caves. Yet if there were fossils here, the sea got to them first. A farmer suggested searching near a large pitch apple tree rooted above a damp cave. Huh. The undergrowth was overgrown, but they found the tree by its dark green leaves. Pitch apple hole is a natural trap 70 feet deep. No one knew what lay down there. Only One thing about Cenozoic mammals is they sure do seem to love falling into holes and dying. Whether it's the La Brea, whether it's the the tar pits at, at La Brea, or whether it's at uh, Natural Trap Cave in South Dakota, or whether it's at, what was this called? Pitch Apple Hole? Uh... Pitch Apple Hole is a natural trap 70 yeah. feet deep. No one knew what lay down there. Only that if a creature fell in, there was no way out. Unless you're a bird and you can fly. Others had come here, but none dared risk the fate of the curious. McFarlane has an advantage. Yeah, interesting, Castor. I mean, that's he not only knows caves, he knows how to climb down into them. Oh. Okay. Well, it's about equally bad by, by rope or by ladder. No problem. I'll get you down. You sure we're going to find some ambly rice down there? The chances are good. We didn't finish it off before. Okay, I think we're ready. 
Natural right. Trap Cave in Wyoming. Or, uh, South Dakota, sorry. South Dakota. Without an expert along. Yeah. Um, this is from, uh, uh, Kirk Johnson, who we saw earlier, the Leaf Scientist, earlier in today's stream, and Ray Troll, well-known artist in paleontology. Um, this is Ray Troll's take on Natural Trap Cave. And is it in Wyoming or is it in South Dakota? I'm not totally sure. But yeah, 40,000 mammals can be wrong. <laughs> Natural Trap Cave in... Um, uh, Natural Trap Cave is shaped like a short-necked beer bottle. The opening, roughly 20 feet wide, appears as an ominous hole in the floor of a gentle valley on the top of a limestone plateau. And that is in... Well, there is the entrance to it right there that's been thankfully gated off to prevent any other large mammals from plummeting down into it. But, uh... Wind River Basin, Bighorn River... This sounds like Wyoming. Is this in Wyoming? After Trump is in Wyoming. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, northern Wyoming. All right. Um... Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Anyway, similar idea to uh, to right here. Uh, critters would fall in, and they wouldn't fall out. Or climb out. Yeah. No one would try this. One slip could be fatal. If the fall didn't kill you, time would. The descent is such an ordeal that no one will go back up till the end of the day, 12 hours away. Hmm. What a way to go. I know, right, Cosmic Sagan? Yeah. yeah. The fossil hunters are working a cold trail. The giant rat Amblerisa hasn't been tracked in half a century. Pitch Apple Hole began as a cavern. For centuries, groundwater slowly hollowed out the limestone. Hmm. Inevitably, the roof fell in, turning the cave into a pit and a trap. You bringing another bucket, Don? Don't find me going on down there. Sparky Pogwash, that's the thing. You know, as paleontologists, we do some crazy stuff for fossils sometimes. That's, yeah, that's part of the job. <laughs> Thanks. A little yeah, pocket to fill in here. Yeah. There's this breakdown. A bit deeper than the other stuff. Then. Right. So it's another place where we can expect to find a few bones. Um, mm -hmm. Clearly, these animals were in here before this roof collapsed. Iguana. The humidity reaches 90%, and the temperature passes 90 degrees. Yeah, the cave is swarming with mosquitoes. Sand flies and the stench of bat guano. Wow. Pitch Apple Hall may once have been a maze of grottos, but after the roof fell in, earth gradually heaped up and any passages out were sealed off. The cave is now a dead end. Within hours, the fossil hunters hit rock. Under the rock, they may find their quarry, a creature trapped down here long ago, covered over time by earth and shielded from erosion ever since. The rocks are too heavy to lift. McFarlane will try to blast them apart. Okay, we're gonna use explosives here? Okay, okay. Sounds dangerous in a cave environment where the roof has previously collapsed thus opening it up, but nowadays they would probably just use like a, a kind of expanding compound like we used to use in uh, in northern Montana uh, in the Judith River Formation up near Rudyard, Montana. Uh, Liz Friedman would use this like expanding clay or she would, you know, use a big rock drill or a masonry drill and like if we need to get rid of a really, really big rock, 
drill down into it and then put this expanding clay inside, stuff it into the hole, and then it grows and grows and grows and cracks the rock so that you can lift it out in pieces. Um, presumably they didn't have that here, so they're using explosives. For the sake of any fossils, hey, as well. well as the fossil hunters, he uses a small amount of explosive. Hmm. in the hole, yeah. Okay. Oh, nothing too crazy. Underneath the rock, the fossil hunters have struck pay dirt. Huh. The story of the giant rat. And just like that, I mean, yeah, that was a pretty dramatic transition there, you know? Yeah, it, it didn't actually happen like that. <laughs> the fossil hunters have struck pay dirt. Yeah. Not supposed to blow the door or something. It's by bed, yeah. The story of the giant <laughs> rat begins with two other creatures. A century ago, phosphate was mined here for fertilizer. It was found in the guano of birds and bats. And guano was found in caves. In 1868, a Philadelphia manufacturer named Henry Waters received a shipment of phosphate from Anguilla. Ah. Uh, Philadelphia, you say? Well, well, well. What? Famous uh, post-bellum paleontologist hailed from Philadelphia, chat. Hmm. Hmm. The Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences, perhaps? Uh, not Batman, Gene Wen. Not Rocky Balboa, man, in space. Not Denver Fallon. <laughs> Denver's not that old. <laughs> Nor am I, Gertis Bucca. No. You know who had it right was Salamander right there. Edward Drinker Cope. Amid the guano, waters found unexpected cargo. There, we'll, he'll be brought up here, I think. Yep, there he is. Paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope was astounded. The bones were the remains of a rat. A 300 pound rat. Cope eventually received a hoard of bones from Anguilla. Yet he never figured out how such a large creature thrived on such a small island, or why it finally disappeared. I don't know if he actually was much of a Minutes rat, after yeah, blasting right. through rock, the yeah. fossil hunters at last find what they've come for. Oh! Oh my god! Head of a femur. And a large one, too. And this looks like it might be another piece. It's fresh room. Fresh room. Where was it? Right it came out right, right here. Excellent. See, we really do find things. And even Don can tell the difference between a goat and an amblorizer. <laughs> Some shade being thrown there. Under the rock lay the bones of the giant rat. Amblorisa. Dozens of fossils were found. Not actually a rat. Except the most important. In the case of Amblorisa, the biggest single part we're missing is the skull. And since we only have skull bits, it's been very hard to try and piece together where Amblorisa yeah, belongs. In... Yeah, Ken says, I know they were crazy rich and delegated, but I'm always surprised by how much Cope and Marsh got up to. Oh, yeah. Especially since, I mean, it kind of makes sense when you realize that they were the... After a while, they were really the only two paleontologists in North America. So, like, any important fossils would go to them. Joseph Leidy, of course, was, like, maybe the first true American paleontologist, but due to Marsh's and Cope's antics, 
Joseph Lighty quit paleontology, so then it was just them, you know? But yeah, yeah, so like... It, it is still crazy to consider how much they published and like all the things that they worked on, though. It's a different time. Yeah. In regard to other rodents in its particular evolutionary group. Let's consider the position of Amblyriza within the group known as New World Rodents. They include species like the capybara, chinchilla, yeah. guinea pig, and many others. But according to the fossil evidence, we think that the line that gave rise to Amblyriza separated at a very early point, maybe 30 million years ago, from the other rodents. Amblyriza resembled the capybara of South America, weighing up to 100 pounds. I it's wonder if that phylogeny is still... Like it, Amblyriza probably had a squarish head, a flat nose, and no tail. But Amblyriza was three times bigger. And Dinosaur Dave says, if you could go back and work with one of them, either Marsh or Cope, which one you would you work with, and which one would you try to correct to modern knowledge of things? Oh, boy. Uh, that's tricky. That's tricky. Um... I suspect, on a personal level, I'd probably get along better with Marsh than with Cope. Um, I know Cope is supposed to be, like, the correct answer, but, um... Yeah, but of these two guys, Othniel Charles Marsh, the one who looks kind of like Paul Giamatti there, with the beard, and Edward Drinker Cope, who... I've been told looks kind of like Gary Oldman. There should totally be a movie about these guys with that casting there. Um, I don't know. From what I know about both of them, I think I would probably get along better with Marsh. And, uh... Yeah, but they were both real knuckleheads. You know? Both ornery, cantankerous fellows. Yeah. And there goes Salamander, yeah. <laughs> and is it due to no natural predators? Uh, oh, their rivalry? It wasn't, Rat Thing. No, no. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about the Marsh Cope rivalry another time. <laughs> There'll be plenty of opportunities uh, in the coming months to talk about this. But yeah. No, due to no natural predators that Amblyriza got so big, probably Rathing, yeah, yeah. Um, island gigantism often works that way. Where it's like, if you've got no big predators... Small animals like rats are able to evade predators by being able to hide, by being able to just, like, escape into small enclaves due to being small. If you don't have any big predators around... really many predators to speak of at all, you might tend to get big on a small island. Um, likewise, really, really large animals like elephants, when they end up on a small island, they tend to shrink, because they don't have to be super big anymore in order to, uh, to combat predators, so they can afford to be a lot smaller and have larger population sizes. So yeah, good question, Rathang. Yeah. The fossil hunters never found a large bone intact. Is bone more beard? It's been now right able to build a yeah. plaster model of the rat based on the bones of an extinct relative and on the fragments from Cope's collection and the cave. The most spectacular feature of this skeleton as it's now set out is the huge size of the skull, which you can see very easily. And then somewhat harder to see, Here's perhaps, <laughs> is the nature of the relationship in size between yeah. the forelimb and the hind limb. The hind limb is very massively built, implying that the animal used its hind limb to support its entire body weight. Yeah, mostly like a capybara. Amblyriza was not only heavy, but slow. With such large hindquarters and small forelimbs, it must have lived free of predators. Else nature wouldn't have let it waddle down the path of evolution, go, unlike its fleet-footed cousin. The fossils reveal other... Any predators that they did have were probably like eagles, 
and critters like that on a small island like Anguilla. In fact, let's let's find a map. Um, yeah. So there is Anguilla. That's just east of Puerto Rico. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Um, yeah, not a lot of predators around there. Maybe eagles. You're not going to have, like, saber-toothed cats. Or short-faced bears or anything running you down. Yeah. Clues to the rat's life. The animal probably spent a good no deal of birds. time there you're rapping, yeah. Yeah. in postures where the weight of the animal was directed right over the lower skeleton. And that the forelimb did not support the weight, but instead was used to pull down branches and vegetation toward the mouth so that the animal could feed. In the gardens of ancient Anguilla, <laughs> Amlariza may have been the only diner. Paleontologists have found no trace of other large mammals living alongside it. Yeah. And Rat Figgy says, I really wish they'd stop calling it a rat. I know, right? I mean, I feel like they kind of... The producers of this show probably like, oh yeah, that's our angle. That's our angle. Giant rat. Which reminds me of this. You've probably seen this before, I'm guessing. This is a video that really made the rounds a few years ago. Check it out. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So this was all over the place. Like, oh, look at this giant rat take a shower. And all these people are like, oh, rat, big rats. Well, we got big rats in my neighborhood. Look at, they're almost as big as this. They're much dirtier, though. This is not a rat. This is a South American mammal called a Pacarana. Yeah. Um. They do like Gatorade. Yeah, <laughs> basta. Do the thing. Yeah, now we're talking. Oh, <laughs> great. So this is probably the closest living relative to Amblariza. From what I understand. It was a monkey. Yeah, Pacarana. Uh, no soap there, this Pacarana. They do like grooming themselves. For certain. Yeah. But not exactly rat finky. Yeah, not a rat at all. So, Pacarana like this are... There. Let's go to Rodentia, the rodents. Yeah. There we go. And let's go to Pacarana. It's probably going to be a short trip because I think they're pretty basal. Yeah. Pacarana. Dynomize. Renica. Cool name. So they're actually really closely related to porcupines. I didn't know that. That's really cool. Yeah. Um. Cool stuff. Yeah. So our giant rat Amblariza really seems to be a giant Pacarana. Or similar rodent. Closer to porcupines than to rats. But yeah, and also close to uh, chinchillas. Um, right? Capybara, Goody. Yeah, belonging to this clade here. We're kind of close to cavies as well. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Makes sense? Imagine an animal like this, but, you know, roughly the size of a bear. 
you got Amblariza. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. A bathing rat, Pacarana. Yeah. I can see that my uh, 50,000 a year has been well spent. Well spent indeed, Blue Front. Thank you for the 32 months of support right there. More recently at Tier 3, thank you, Blue Front. I really appreciate that support. How are you doing? I hope you're ready for the weekend. It's good to have you here. Thank you, and Lenina. Thank you, and Lenina, for everything that you do for this channel and for this community. I really appreciate it. I really do. Yeah. SV Hargan says, more bathing rat? Well, I mean, if you insist. Um... Well, here's one getting some scritches. Yeah. Pacarana. So these are kind of slow moving rodents related to porcupines. Yeah. Yeah. The truth about the rat that bathes was. <laughs> it sounds delightful. Pacarana, the truth about the rat that bathes. That sounds like some sort of cryptic clue. In order to find the treasure, you must first find the rat that bathes. Animales del mundo. Animals of the world. You know, I'd be surprised to find animals that are not of the world. Not long ago in social networks appeared this video that according to people thought it was a rat. Uh, yeah. So Pacarana. Yeah. These nice roses live in South America, in their western region, from Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Venezuela, and a region in the west of Brazil, inhabiting hillsides and valleys of the tropical jungles in the mountains of the Andes, encompassing all three Andean mountain ranges. Lugares con una altitud de 250 a 3200 metros sobre el nivel del mar pertenece al orden de los roedores, siendo el tercero más third largest rodent in the world, being the only living exponent of the family of dinomayans. Or before they were very abundant on the planet. Este mamífero mide unos 73 a 79 centímetros de alto. So this is like the only living close relative of Amblyrhiza. Y alcanzando un peso de 10 a 18 kilogramos. Su cuerpo tiene forma de barril con un pelaje pardusco en la parte superior con dos go. franjas blancas continuas a lo largo yeah. de la espalda y algunas filas de puntos so en cada lado sus cabezas son cuadradas rat, really. pequeños y orejas de porcupines de un menor. el labio superior es leporino es decir yeah good stuff anyway um so a giant extinct pacarana relative was amblariza nothing could stop amblariza from growing as big as it wished Except geography. Hmm. An island of 34 square miles cannot support a race of 300 pound rats. There must have been more to the story. Well, the wombat look? More to That's the interesting, island. Murph, because wombats are not anywhere close to related. They're marsupials. The inhabitants of Anguilla harvest about the as far as you can get the land. on the mammal family tree. What little grows on this far Caribbean enough. island far, couldn't support a huge you plant get. eater. <laughs> yeah. But 200,000 years ago, Anguilla looked like its neighbor, St. Martin. Huh. On such bounty, the giant rat Amblariza thrived. Ah, so the island used to be larger. Anguilla was not only greener, it was bigger. Yeah. Twelve times its size today. The world was gripped by an ice age, and the seas had fallen. There we go. Anguilla, St. Martin, and St. Bart's were one big island, Greater Anguilla. Yeah, very cool. The thing that drives me is to try and understand why Amblariza got to the West Indian Islands in the first place. There are two theories, and an advocate for each. Ross believes the rat walked across on a land bridge that later submerged as sea levels rose. 
Don thinks the rat drifted over on a natural raft. Don can seemingly very easily visualize uh, pregnant females grasping onto rafts, floating off into the sea, traveling thousands of kilometers under the hot tropical sun, pulling up on a beach, darting out and immediately having a successful life thereafter. I have a few problems with that. Ross would uh, take the view that uh, rafting is a rather unlikely event, which it did certainly... Oh man, this is wonderful. Oh, I love this! So this is a, is a, a classic debate in paleontology. Land bridges versus vegetation rafting. When you've got a population of animals that like arrives on an island somewhere and you don't know how in the world they got there, and this is long before the invention of boats or anything like that. You know, this is sometimes millions of years ago. How did they get there? Did they get there by rafting on vegetation? Or did there used to be land bridges that existed there? Um, classic, classic, classic debate. In paleontology. Ross would uh, take the view that uh, rafting is a rather unlikely event, which it, it certainly is, um, although I would argue that given enough time, unlikely events happen. Ross would prefer yeah. uh, a geological explanation in which there was some form of, of, of dry land or damp land in which the animals could have trotted over uh, without their, all of their, well, their friends from South America. And I think it's a matter of looking, probably more by geologists than paleontologists, but evidence of a land bridge to these islands from South America will one day be found. And then we'll forget about rafting. It'll become a piece of history. If you want to know where I, you know, what I think about this, land bridges are one of those things that, like, it's easy to kind of wave your arms and say, well, oh, yeah, there must have been a land bridge here. But animals tend to be really resilient. And we're dealing with a lot of time here. You know? Millions upon millions of years. And you only need a couple of individuals, you know, to be blown on a big vegetation raft during a storm to get to a certain area. And then the world's their oyster after they land in this new island where, you know, they can survive and thrive. I think rafting is the more parsimonious answer here, but it is kind of a matter of conjecture and opinion. And again, I don't work on mammals, so who even cares what I think? Yeah. Natural raft or natural bridge, the rat somehow reached the island. There it thrived, until one day it spawned a second mystery by vanishing. Yeah. Back in Pitch Apple Hole, more traces of more rats emerge. And Ken says, I understand that rafting can sound like magical thinking, and I do believe there were occasional land bridges in some areas, but the idea that there are all these magical land bridges that conveniently disappear right before modern times is almost biblical. I agree wholeheartedly, Ken. We're on the same page there. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one thing that, that people sometimes don't take into account is that geological time is so vast. And over millions upon millions of years, there would be some instances in which certain creatures could, you know, drift across on rafts. We see that in modern creatures, like iguanas, for instance. Um, it's not, it's also not that uncommon, like, for, for creatures to, to cling to vegetation rafts. Um, in fact, I think this was even featured in Prehistoric Planet. I think... Darren Nash probably had this written into the script because he's probably a fan of this idea as well. Um, was it Zalmoxes, I think? Yeah, there we go. In the aftermath of a tropical storm, debris is drifting downstream. Yeah. And amongst the wreckage, Rafts of vegetation ripped from the land. For a weary pterosaur, this one may be a welcome place to rest. Uh-oh. we got a Mosasaur swimming around through there. But it's far from safe.
huge mosasaur, a deadly underwater hunter, is looking for an easy meal. Such as this little dinosaur, Zalmoxes. Staying here is too risky. He needs a larger raft, and quickly. No little... There's little choice, but to swim this year. Grab the Donchian. the first here. Another castaway. A female. Oh, lucky him. And lucky her. Their raft is drifting out to sea. Sometimes, the ways on rafts like these <laughs> are washed up on the shores of distant islands. If they're very lucky, this pair could become pioneers. Yeah. And so that's the thing, is that even very, very statistically unlikely events, like this actually happening and it being successful and these creatures, you know, colonizing a new land, That's not that's not going to happen very often, you know, like it's a rare, rare, rare event. But when you've got millions upon millions of years to work with. Eventually, some of these times they're going to get very lucky, you know, it's just kind of the rule of large numbers, you know. Oh, yeah. Bits in here. Yeah. Oh, a marvelous Ooh, cloth. Nice. It's quite large for the animal's size. And Murph says, so wouldn't other rafters have to show up to keep the population from stagnating, from interbreeding? It depends. With creatures like rats um, or or mammals, I don't know what it is for like birds or, or other reptiles, but you can have <coughs> populations that start from very, very small numbers of individuals. Um... I don't know, most like breeds of dogs, like purebred dogs, sometimes there's like a single pair of dogs that is the, you know, the forebears for that entire breed afterward. So again, sometimes you get lucky there too, you know? But yeah, yeah. Gene wants this infinite monkeys with infinite typewriter scenario almost. Yeah. There you go, Gene Wen. There you go. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I believe that's uh, that's this scenario right here. This is a thousand monkeys working at a thousand typewriters. Soon, they'll have written the greatest novel known to man. Let's see. It was the best of times. It was the blurst of times. You stupid monkey. Oh, shut up. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, there's always a Simpsons clip. It's happened what twice today, at least. It's pretty good average. Anyway, let's uh, let's continue with this right here. Talking about Ambleriza, uh, one of the largest rodents that ever lived for Groundhog Day, and very strongly curved. The thickness of it indicates that it was probably used a lot in digging, which would make sense in an animal that's largely relying on vegetation for food. Almost like a bird, isn't it? Mm. When you're both concentrating very hard on a specific mm -hmm. problem and you're coming at it from different angles, it's a result of that combination 
that you can really start putting things together. And that's how it's worked with McFarlane and I out here. We're able to put together things as a team in a way that we couldn't do separately. All the fossils that can be dated are roughly the same age, about 125,000 years old. Huh, As recent. they pour over the bones, a surprise turns up. In size, they vary wildly. Uh, uh -huh. Ontogeny, perhaps? In size, it, partly preserved, just the enamel cap. That's an this incisor the there? That's a tooth? The well, these ones teeth? That are much smaller than this. You can compare it to this jaw found much earlier, and you can see that they match up very well in size. This one is clearly s somewhat smaller. It's the amazing thing about this, this particular beast. There's fantastic range among individuals. We found teeth that are half this size. Great. Different sizes of teeth hey. mean different sizes of rat. At its largest, Amlariza was about the size of a bear. At its smallest, only the size of a wolf. Okay. Huh. This is the power of the upper jaw. And each one of these holes in life would have supported a tooth. This is a tooth of Amblariza separately found. And the interesting thing here is that this tooth is obviously far too large to have ever been part of this particular animal. <laughs> Although it was found in the same cave and almost in the same place. This is another indication of the massive, totally. massive size right. Goober fuzz, yeah, yeah. in Amblariza populations. And post the last Ice Age? I think the last Ice Age was more recent than that, Cosmic Seagan, actually. 125,000 years ago is, is... I want to say the last Ice Age ended something like, like less than 20,000 years ago? Yeah, the last... Pleistocene glacial maximum. Um, yeah, here. Was it the Wisconsinian glaciation? Um, the most recent glacial period of North, uh, the North American ice sheet complex. It extended from approximately seventy-five thousand to just eleven thousand years ago. Yeah. So those Amblariza fossils, if they are dated to 125,000 years ago. That's before the last big glacial pulse, the Wisconsin glaciation. And that's here where you're looking at a, like a top-down view of the Earth, like looking down from the North Pole. Black is where these areas would be covered by glaciers. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so this ended only like 11,000 years ago. Yeah. Anyway, let's continue. Such different sizes over so short a time are a fluke of nature. Amblariza, the beast with no predators, was adapting to some other threat. With nowhere to run, the rat was caught in a pitfall and trying to claw its way out. Hmm. After an entire day of combing through the dirt of Pitchapple Hole, the fossil hunters face the challenge of every creature before them, getting out. Uh-oh. Climbing Hopefully. 70 feet down was unnerving. Climbing back up is exhausting. I've done this before, actually. I've rappelled down into a cave before at, at Moaning Caverns in Northern California. Um, I've done this. It's, uh, it's something. Is it Moaning Caverns? Yeah, here. Before the onslaught of the beast. In there. The what? The, beast. the what? The, beast. the who? The I didn't catch that. Could you, could you repeat that? One more time? The beast. Again? The beast. I'm sorry. The Raven, thank you for the 13 months, and, and one, one more time, what was it, the what? The, the who? I, I'm sorry. The Raven, thank you so much for those 13 months of support. I really appreciate that, The Raven. Thank you, thank you for keeping me online for the past 13 months. That's a long time. It's like, almost a whole year. Appreciate you. Uh, yeah. Request for California Gold. 
miners found the opening to Moaning Caverns in 1840. With only yeah. ropes and candles, they made their descent into a cave 10 million years old. I've done this before. 110 feet deep. Today's yeah. venture isn't as harrowing thanks to modern day technology and awesome tour guides like Serena Barth. Today we're gonna to be heading 165 feet down into the earth. But first we need to go into this back room here. Come on in. Yeah. Our descent down into the moaning caverns begins with an Indian. I should ask my dad if he has pictures of this. Holy moly. Oh yeah, it's tight. To a 165 foot tall spiral staircase that was built here in the 1920s. The yeah. material used to build the staircase came from decommissioned World War I battleships that were being taken <laughs> apart. Sturdy. Ooh, y'all put my fear of heights to the test today. <laughs> and kind of scary. So but the, reaching that final step is... The way that this works when I was there is that you rappel down into it on a rope and then you walk your way up the staircase afterward. Well worth it. Yeah. As you look around to see a grandiose cave of wonders. Yeah, it's there's really amazing in there. No way. So they did all this work and there's no gold yeah. in here. They're credited with discovering um, California's largest vertical chamber that's open to the public, but they couldn't huh. see it because they had a candle. For Destination California, wow. I'm Melanie Townsend. Cool stuff. Yeah, that's Moaning Caverns in California. Uh, so yeah, so I've, I've done kind of this sort of thing before. Don DeBlue. Holy cow. Uh, one of our crew chiefs this past summer, he did caving work in search of fossils in Madagascar. Uh, like rappelling down every day and then climbing back up. Um, that was really, really cool. And, uh, hopefully this summer I can have him tell you some stories about that. But looking for fossils of giant lemurs and stuff like that in, uh big underground cavern in Madagascar. Sounds like a really, really cool stuff. Uh, he would, says Ken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The things we do for fossils, chat. Uh, That's got to be exhausting after a whole day of... The end of the day is the start of his worries. Looking up from the bottom of Pitt Chapel, 50, 60, 70 feet to the top, the thing that went through my mind mostly <laughs> was having gotten down here, having found something, how am I going to get my fossils back up and my person? After 12 yeah. hours of digging, and then the the bucket up rope. of climbing. Sometimes it's too much. I'm sorry. Uh, Go on. Yep. How you doing? You going back down? You going down? Oh boy. I just seem to get spooked at this point. Okay. You want to you want to reverse? I'm afraid I'm gonna have to. No problem. Trying stuff. Ross escapes you know? on his second try. Claire opts for the winch method. Okay, how you doing? Okay. Caves are, are the uh, only parts of the Earth's surface that are, are unexplored in, in a large degree at the present time, and which are accessible to people with, with you know, reasonable budgets and, and uh, skills. So the opportunity to explore uh, in, in previously unknown caves is, is in itself, I think, quite a reward. I think. Uh, both of our reactions to finding uh, the first specimens was, was just one of, of vindication because many people suggested that it wouldn't be found. That's great. For the king rat of Anguilla, the island at last became a trap. 125,000 years ago, the ice age ended and the ice caps melted. Within a century, the seas rose 20 feet. Yep, that made the island the much smaller. to adapt, but Anguilla was shrinking faster than Amblariza. In a race between evolution and weather, the giant rat lost. The seas are still rising. 
Within the next century, global warming may submerge even more of Anguilla. Unlike Amblyriza, the inhabitants can fend for themselves on higher ground, instead of perishing like rats on a sinking ship. Cliches. Yeah, there you go. Paleo World. Here is a link to that if you'd like to see it yourself. Yeah. Good stuff. And of course, we're all rising for the Paleo World anthem here. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. And welcome, welcome to So On 1033. How are you doing? It is good to have you here and a very happy Groundhog Day to you. Uh, the reason we've been talking about rodents for most of today's stream, both their fossil history and their modern biodiversity. Rodents are really, really cool, and I hope you've got a better appreciation of them, chat after today's stream. They really are really cool critters. Rodents often aren't people's favorites. Well, sometimes they are. There's some very passionate people who love rodents very dearly. But you know, you gotta respect them. And so on, thank you for the follow. Appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Um, with that having been said. It's now time for me to wrap things up. I've been streaming for more than four hours at this point. So, let's go ahead and run our credits. Get ready to raid out of here. Don't go away just yet, chat. We've got some more exciting science content coming up. Uh, from Science Streams. Uh, from... So let's do that. Made it science streams. We're gonna go visit with some other scientists. With Belint and Lita, who are actually no, maybe just Belint right now. Um, but hope well is Lita on too? Oh, Lita's on too. Excellent. You're in for a treat, everybody. Belint and Lita are two active research scientists. They are molecular and systems biologists, and they also do science outreach here on Twitch. They are wonderful, and they're doing some science news tonight. New species, snail regeneration, insect flight, RNA, bacteria, memories, and more. Let's go check them out. Everybody, thank you for making today today's stream a, a lovely stream. I appreciate all of your support, your enthusiasm, your questions. Your moderation, moderators, your follows, your subscriptions, your cheers, your gifts, everything, everybody. And uh, happy Groundhog Day to you. May your spring come early this year. Without further ado, let's go right into Science Streams. Everybody, you have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you again on Monday. And I'll see you in Science Streams chat. Take care. Bye-bye.